Good evening. It's Monday, October 16th, and this is a meeting of the South Borough Planning Board. The Planning Board is now in session. The first item on the agenda is MBTA communities scheduling the mapping workshops. Colleen, do you want to take it from here? I'm just going to sit out here just saying simple things. Turn the microphone on. Um, so the scheduling of them, we quickly went over how long it might take. So we're thinking an hour to two hours. All right. Um, can I show you what we'll be doing first? So the mapping um, exercise is basically going to be a map like this at each table. And we're thinking about eight, eight tables. Um, there is room. I did check. There's room and availability at the senior center for any Saturday um, and not Thursday evenings. So you're pretty wide open with what we can schedule. And we'll open up all three rooms. All right, so the mapping thing, we'll have a map like this that has the green space, all the water bodies, um, and the orange is privately owned. All the restricted land is sort of shown right here. So we'll, we have a copy of this we can print and we'll have one at each table. Um, the actual map isn't to scale, so we found five parcels that equaled one acre each. So these are five acre stickies. And the attendees will be instructed to sort of put them where they think it should go, the, the overlay zoning. We need 10 down in this area. Oh, my sticky's not working sticky anymore. There you go. And just see where see where everybody is, and then we'll get together afterwards and discuss the different areas um, and why they chose them, and maybe come. There'll be some intelligence we'll get out of the whole thing. Um, is there any more that anybody wants to add to this? Well, just anybody? to uh, give you an idea, this Lexington did this, and these are the examples of the ten tables that they had, and they that what was done at their mapping sessions. There's a set of instructions there too that they'll be given. Um, did you get to look at those, Debbie? So uh, the e each sticky is equal to five acres. So they'll need to each table will need to place ten. Yes. And and so I think this is a question just as to how to organize if we should kind of what would be I think would be helpful is if we is there a sign up process. Or could we do a sign up process or is it just show up? Because, you know, I think that it, if we get the entire group of people that like live in certain areas together to can kind of come to, to with each table or pre-assign or something like that or designate if there's a way to do that. I just don't know who we're expecting, but to get people to collaborate a little bit on a combination. So each person has to put in two yellow stickies in the yellow half mile radius and then the remaining three somewhere else in the town of Southboro. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds, yeah. Right. Is it, or, or wait, one is equal to five, the 10. So they have to do 10 stickies, two and eight. Yes. Yes. And, and, okay. And then again, on the instruction sheet, excuse me, it does say that 25 acres must be contiguous. So it's not a five acre, five acre, five acre, five acre. 25 contiguous, and then the 10 need to be by the station, and that leaves us five. Okay, <laughs> perfect. It's um, 10 acres at the station, and then 25 have to be contiguous, so that's 35 unless the 10, unless the, um, the contiguous portion, the 25 is contiguous to the train station area. I don't see that. that I don't see that happening either. either. I don't yeah. think that's going to be a problem. So then 35, so then 15 acres somewhere else. And those 15 don't have to be contiguous. They can be five everywhere else. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thanks. I think it's an excellent um, exercise. And so what, Marnie, what you were recommending is that um, if we get a group just open attendees, they could all be from one sector of the town. And then you'll get a biased 
feedback. Um, so if we ask people to sign up, um, we may have a better sense of it, but you can't control that you get every, you know, different parts of the town attending. Right. Or we could just do it differently as people walk in. Like if we have eight tables, then we label each table and we just give out your table one, your table two. And so that we make sure that it's evenly distributed across and it's, it could still be biased just based on who walks in at what time, but yeah. at least then it's somewhat a little bit more random as to who's coming in. And I think that's what they did in Lexington. They assigned numbers, table numbers to people when they yeah. walked in. Yeah. yeah, and honestly, we can advertise it um, through the email list that I have and through, say, a news flash and something on the website as bring a neighbor, Yeah, work with a neighbor, you know, kind of make that suggestion out there. Colleen, how big is your list of of uh, interested people? Just from the forum alone, um, I have probably 35 names. Um, some are couples, but. So the person that is at the table, are they also taking notes to try to understand, like, why did you pick this part of the street instead of that part of the street? I mean, that'll be part of, I think, the discussion afterwards, have people sort of explain how they chose and why, um, you know, and then maybe, you know, within their groups, they, they'll probably be discussing it while they're placing them, since it's a group effort. Um, to that point, I think it's a great idea that we actually provide a template where they have to fill out, like why they've selected the areas. Okay. And and um, I think that's a good point because people will forget when it comes time to present or they don't want to present. So at least we'll capture their their feedback. And then we can all float along who's ever attending, can float along to each table and help them along. Yeah. Like a notes sheet. At each yeah, table where sort of a template where we're we're providing, you know, where did you put your, why did you put the ten acres next to, you know, where you did at the railroad, where, why? where did you chose the twenty five, not where, but why did you choose this, why did you select this, and where did you place your your remaining three stickies, not leading, but just th they have to put the ten right. So why, where did, why did you choose it? So it's really just asking very open questions, but it I. You know, that's easy enough to create an award document. You can do and, that. And I'll go back and um, view the video and, and find out if there was any special kind of instructions that they gave verbally that weren't written anywhere that might have helped people along how they picked or something. Um, I know that at workshops I've attended, like at Mass Housing, MHP, um, where they have their annual meeting and they do little work groups like that. They break the crowd up into 15 groups and it's maybe four people and you collaborate in that little mini group and then the host says okay table number one what did you do and they d did have some kind of little guidance sheet and then they each table picks a speaker who is more comfortable and then they speak for the group yeah kind of thing so I thought that worked it does work well I think from at least from what they were doing with us then so the uh results of this uh, process that's going to come back to this board and then we could make adjustments from there before the public hearings for the um, warrant article thanks and i think from there depending on um where we decide the overlays are going to go. We'll write the the bylaw or bylaws, depending on whether we want different uh, regulations in different areas. So I had one other, um... Colleen, just real quick before. Yeah, can you do that? Is that I, I'm just not sure you're allowed to have different criteria for different pieces of. Okay. Yeah, you can have five different. Well, not five different districts, I suppose a few different districts. You could have one that was just multifamily overlay. Right. You have one that's multifamily with um, bottom floor. So you could commercial. anticipate having several sections added as districts, as overlay districts. Okay. Kind of under the MBTA heading. Yeah. Okay. Just making sure. 
So, and the only other thing that I had that I thought might come in useful, and this was actually a affordable housing exercise, um, is something with the Legos because it shows spatially kind of how it's gonna look. So without having done all the numbers on this, um, this could be a, each one of these is a hundred square feet, kind of how I figured it out. So this is a 2,600 square foot ranch with its parking. This one would be parking underneath with the yellow being commercial. Oh, I'm sorry, you can actually see this. All right, so white being residential, yellow being commercial. It, this was just in case we had a commercial um, requirement to it. And then above is more residential, multifamily, and kind of figuring out the parking. So there is parking underneath, but to meet the parking requirement for this, we would still need parking elsewhere. So we would have the park, some parking out here just to kind of spatially like, would you rather have all of the parking under and have it be taller? Or would you rather have no parking under, you know? Um, it, spread yeah, spread out the footprint. It's just a visual that I thought might help if, if it comes into need and we'll have, I'll have better numbers exactly. You know, this is a 2000 square foot house and this is, my Legos, I couldn't find. Have you ever tried to buy Legos? They come in nothing but kits now. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, but um, something I'll write up on this. We'll have it there in case we need it. Um, I don't know if anybody's going to be confused on that sort of a thing. Just to be clear, it, would that be um, the host or you are having the example ready? It's is, is it going to be something that each table has a little pallet and they can build something? Or is it more for demonstration for the host at the one? Um, I was planning on having a demonstration yeah. and just kind of having some things laid out saying this is, you know, um, a single family home on one acre. Mm -hmm. And here is, you know, um, a two family house on a half an acre. And this is what it looks like, 15 units on one acre. Yeah. And then you can do it different ways. So, so like a some, one block, something you can play with. One block might represent a certain number of units. So you'd have 15 white blocks and you'd have to put them on that green plate palette to show if you want 15 units spread out on one story. Right. And you have very little green left or you have 15 uh, white blocks piled up and you have a 15 story <laughs> um, exactly. building, but you have a whole bunch of green space left around there. And then exactly. so you could see the relationship. I, I just thought if we were to decide to do a commercial um, requirement, which I hear EDC is kind of looking at, um, that this might be a we, <laughs> everybody wants in, their piece in the, in this little. Have they exercise. met and discussed this at all? EDC? Pardon? Have they met and discussed this at all? Um, I believe they have. I haven't seen Leah this week. She comes in Tuesday through Thursday, oh. but yeah, they, they definitely have an interest if it's going to help them along Route 9. So you mentioned a commercial requirement. Mm -hmm. would would a better way to phrase that or a possible way to phrase that be a commercial allowance? I mean, why would we require commercial? I'm lost on that a little bit. Um, say a downtown district, a lot of um, the planning uh, norms these days have the storefronts on the bottom and then they have residential above. So well, I know that's allowed, but it certainly isn't required. No, but we could require it yeah. along an underutilized section on Route 9. If there was an old building that, you know, like the old um, where the car condos were going, what an ugly piece of land that was, you know. If you could take something like that and require a commercial bottom apartments above, mm -hmm. it would help revitalize that area. But again, that's, that's up to the board all the input we get from the public, it may not be something that this town wants to do. I think the um, the thought being on someplace like Route 9, we have such limited uh, commercial zones in this town that you wouldn't want to lose the ability for commercial on Route 9, so you'd require right. a mixed use. The only thing, I'm just thinking that some developers under certain circumstances might determine that the highest and best use is purely residential. In which case, a requirement that there be commercial 
building doesn't seem, I don't know, I don't see how that makes sense or helps. Well, to the, um, and I'm not speaking for them, but as an economic development I've been involved in the past, it's a wonderful way to bring commercial base into your community and still have your residential uh, units being taken care of. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you require them, the storefronts, it could be a gym, maybe a, a, a public gym underneath. You know, there's a million different things you could do, but it helps the taxpayers. It takes the burden off the residents when you have the more bigger commercial base, obviously. Right. Something that Southboro needs. Right. I mean, or what could happen is we might compel a developer to build a commercial unit that just is vacant. And that that, that could happen. Yeah. Unfortunately. So I'm just, you know, my my support would probably be behind allowance for a commercial rather than something that compels a developer to uh, build a commercial unit that could, structure. Yeah, we'll have to go back to the, um, however you write it, as long as we zone it, I, we can require this or I think we can allow it. I think either way would be okay. Good point, though. Thanks. Any other comments? So I know we discussed this lot coverage yeah. during the, the downtown when uh, there was a push to change from the FAR that we have in all of the zoning to the to a uh, lot coverage. Lot coverage. So I think that's um, useful to understand. But I don't know if that goes with the mapping particularly. Yeah. Just my opinion. I don't yeah. know what so the rest of the board. The says. purpose of the, of this is is to show the proportions, right? I think it's pretty useful. Personally, is is a is that green square supposed to be an acre? Um, this is the part. So there's thirty two by thirty two, and each one of these is in in the instructions I had was a hundred square uh, feet, which makes it easy with the bricks to kind of figure out. So this is eight little dots, so it's 800 square feet. So two of these I figure is your average house. You could do it up and down, you could do it side by side. Um, and then commercial here, they're a little bit different shaped, um, but just the different colors. So you can kind of see where the commercial, I have long skinny ones, so you could do it in a little a little bit different than say a residential unit. Um, but yeah, as a, as a visual, I think it's great, yeah. you know, and we can have them sort of, I'll have them kind of built up as the visual. This is, you know, the four stories everybody's afraid of. This is what it looks like one story down with the parking outside, things like that. That's what I'm hoping it'll visualize for people. Or maybe like split that one thing into four sections exactly. so you can see. Yeah. As a, this was my little residential. I was trying to put something together real quick because I just got these at five o'clock. <laughs> so I'm like, quick, quick, quick. How can I do this? Um, yeah. So there's some some parking and yeah, we'll definitely do something like that. Um, I agree. I think the Lagos is a good use of visualization. I also heard when we did the forum, I didn't attend the second one, but the first one, people wanted to see the 15 units per acre. And I know we didn't have any of those examples. So I don't know if we have, so one, that's helpful, but two, if there's another way. Um, I was clicking through something. Was it the Lexington examples? They had a bunch of ones. They they brought it into like Waltham Corner. Like you saw a bunch of different um, representations. But I think if there's, um, maybe it's our PowerPoint slide where you've already done that, Colleen, and you've shown that, I think having some of those available for people to flip through oh, sure. um, just to see again. And then if there is a 15 um, unit per acre example or examples that we could find on the net, I think it would just help people. Yeah, I think visuals are just definitely helpful in my mind. I had a question about um, accessory dwelling by right. Um, as part of the housing choice law, I think that you're able to have some, one or or maybe more of the districts have accessory apartments by right, if um, as long as you don't change the wording in the law. And 
would we do we have to worry about that now or um do we have do we think maybe as planning board we want to take a position on whether we would have one or more districts or all the districts I'm, i can't recall really i have to go back and take a look at the the law um what, what we're able to have so so i think that that's different than 3a it's in three A. It there is a piece it's of it that's in three A. It is well for the for the town meeting vote, correct? Yes. I guess my question is, do we have to identify the district that we would want to have it? So so it's different because we have a different situation in town, right? We we have a bylaw about accessory apartments, and that's something that is being looked at separately. But under under um, the housing choice law we can choose a district or more than one district that has accessory dwellings by right and i don't know whether uh we have to at some point choose which district that is or do they all have it well number one i would think it would definitely be a residential district because you're not going to put an accessory apartment on anything but a right. residential unit um yes. and honestly i think you know, just adding it to your RA and your RB is not a heavy lifting thing. You could just. So, are you saying you want to add this to the MBTA communities? So, it's part of the MBTA Communities Act. It would it's be already a simple majority there. vote. Okay. Is quite, I, I guess yeah. the correlation you're making. Yeah. If you go changing it, from what I understand, and also from town council, and I think select board have men mentioned it as well. If you change anything, <laughs> um, you need a, a two thirds majority vote. But if you if you leave it as written as the law was written, then it already has a built in section that's a part of uh, accessory dwellings by right. But I think you have to choose which district or. Maybe I just don't understand it. Maybe well, wouldn't it be in the whole in every in anything? I don't think it's every. Maybe if that's right. the case, then there's nothing for us to do. I guess that is my question. Yeah, you really you technically you wouldn't put an accessory dwelling on a duplex or a triplex. It's wow. really meant as a secondary use for a single for the family. primary single family, right? Right, and that's what they're promoting because it does help families. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, you could certainly add it as a by right something to your. I well, I think with, to Deb's point, let's say somebody bought um, a lot in the MBTA communities district, and instead of building, you know, true multifamily housing, they just build a new single family with an ADU, or they they buy a single family and they now they're like, hey, great, I'm in the MBTA zone. Rent. I'll rent out my space. I mean, that's actually becoming more commonplace now that an ADU is, you know, recognized as it's okay to rent it. Yeah. It's not the way we do it now, but. No, and my, other towns I know, they put deed restrictions that they have to be a family member. And that's been. Well, most towns do right now. But it's been widened enough to allow for au pairs and nannies things like that, where it's not necessarily a family member, right. but somebody that's a part of the family unit. But I think, I, I think uh, Deb is on to something where it doesn't, we don't, ha we don't necessarily have to have large multifamily high density housing built in the MBTA. You know, it's yeah. not required. No. Somebody could just add an ADU to an existing single family by right. And I think that would be advantageous. So we just kind of want to make sure when we're doing a review of the um so you want to talk the about the accessory dwelling units by right for single family units in the MBTA. I don't see why we couldn't do that. It seems Let's, yeah. We can look well, into it a little deeper. I just don't know if we have to do anything. Maybe we really don't have to well, do well, it. We're actually reading it for our, our public hearings. We just have to make sure it's in there. I, don't, so, I mean, I don't, I, this is a first for me, so I don't know what's, how this is going to happen, but yeah. normally we read the, the bylaw and go over it with a fine tooth comb piece by piece, and then it goes to town meeting. And so it'll be in there, I hope. Yeah. I think. So I don't see that in MBTA communities. 
I'll, I'll send it to you. Okay. So, so that would be on top of the, so we have to have an allowance for 15 units per acre. And this would be an addition to that would be to allow ADUs by right. I don't know if it's an addition. I, I, I looked look into, into it as into much it as it was sort of intersecting with something, as you know, I'm working on with um, uh, Andrew Dennington from Select Board and Doris Cahill. From Which the, was ADUs by right. Right. And so one of the, my questions to the two of them was, well, if, with MBTA communities coming into town and hopefully would be voted on, is it something that we still would want to do? And so we took a look at the at the law and just agreed that that that's just separate from what that group is looking to do. Well, so if you if you were to do it by right, just for your residential areas, um, it still would have a lower threshold. It doesn't have to be part of the 3A to have the lower threshold. The lower threshold is meant to promote units, the, the building of units. Yeah. Um, so I know I've seen it that way. How you write it into it, I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to look into it a little I'll deeper. I'll have to look into it too. I had looked into it a, a while ago and if I'm incorrect, I'll correct myself, but I'll I'll send along the information that I sent to Mr. Dennington. But the by right one is simple majority. Yeah. Even if it sits alone. So, but that would mean that if the town is voting, the, the warrant article would still be stipulating where these areas are. Not right? necessarily. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be part of 3A. They're suggesting people to to allow them by right, yeah. ADUs by right. Right. Um, and that, if it was a standalone warrant article, nothing to do with MBTA communities, it would still be a lower threshold of a vote. They're trying to make it easier for that. But are you saying that this ADU is part of the MBTA guideline that says you can put no right you're just saying the vote is different i think it i think it's been since everything has been it's it's been brought up i don't know that as part of the housing choice i think it just was listed as one of the features that um you need only a simple majority yeah maybe that's how it was versus said. a special permit like right now uh, accessory dwelling unit requires a special permit right from the zba with a report from the planning board right and that's a four out of five person vote, not three. Well, it's a simple majority at town meeting to pass instead oh, yes, of right. two thirds. Yes. Right. Right. So does it, that mean we would need to write that into our bylaw if we want it? No, it's just so I think I know where we're getting confused. I, you can put it in this, but what it was, I think what you were reading was just saying that these kinds of actions now have a lower voting threshold. Normal zoning is supermajority. And every time you change zoning, whether it's new or you're changing it or yeah. whatever, it's a supermajority. So they've lowered the threshold for new dwelling units, really. In the state law. In the state. So you just yeah. referenced the state law. Like that, I mean, that's, that's, I don't know if you have to necessarily reiterate it in your local code. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you would have to, because that's where the vote is. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm still a little confused on that, so I'll have to read it because I I think it only means in the districts that we're voting to ha to be considered MBTA community, like where our districts are going to be located. I, th I think that they're s separate. I don't think that that's... Okay, okay, I'll, I'll do some reading on it. But it's good if we don't have to do anything, so thank you. Um, I just pulled up the revision of the 3A, the most recent one, and just literally did a find for accessory or accessory dwelling unit. There's nothing in here specific to those words. Okay. So unless it's designated some other words, it's not in this 3A compliance guidelines. Okay. No, I think it stemmed from the housing choice bill and the language in there where it broke up various things of, you know, what else can you count towards MBTA? So if you had an existing downtown village that met certain criteria, you'd already basically have a zone. Um, and then they had other things like if you want accessory dwelling units, the vote is now this because they just what? want to make it easier to pass. Yeah, Chelmsford used one increase housing project based rezoning of one parcel. And that was a simple majority um, and it wasn't considered spot zoning because of the housing choice. So it was a part change the zoning for a project based it was a mix of affordable and and regular units and um, that went through with uh, a simple majority it would not have passed town meeting at a super majority
Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, Lisa, do you, sorry, I forgot about you. Do you have anything to add to this conversation? Um, thanks, Mimi. I think um, everybody covered the questions that I had. Thank you. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Spice. <laughs> so do we want to schedule these is the big thing? Let's get yeah. them scheduled and start working on. Are we, have we decided as a board that you um, definitely want to do a Saturday? Looking at that, I just want to also point out that um, Colleen was notified by um, Bowler, by um, the three A technical assistance folks, and by uh, by Bowler Engineering that they've been authorized to give additional assistance. Um, yeah, they're going to help do our maps and help us with the bylaw, with mapping and bylaw. And then also, I saw an email this morning um, through the Mass Planners Forum about there's additional three A grant money for technical help. Um, to do anything. To yeah, basically they're, they're basically anything. even out anything you need, we'll give you. Yeah. So if we have the opportunity, we could always try and get some of that too. Yeah, we'll take all the help we can get. We're looking at November. Is that when we're looking at? So we can, or was it November? Here's the last one. week in October and November. That 27th, 4th. No, the 30th, <laughs> the 30th and the 6th, last week of October, first week of November. The 30th of November. Yeah, that week of the 30th, October 30th. Oh, yeah. Yes. Do you want to do them in the same week? Is that what you're saying? No, I think we should do them in two separate weeks and that, that we thought maybe a Saturday would, would be helpful, but. Mimi, can I offer a suggestion on Saturdays? Sure. So my only concern on a Saturday is most of the school age parents are back into full blown uh, fall sports. Um, I don't know when they end and I would just be afraid that we might miss a group. I mean, maybe do one Saturday and then one one day, <clears throat> excuse me, during the week to be able to make sure we accommodate everybody versus doing a, just a Saturday for both. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd agree. Yeah, I think that was the intention. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Sorry, I misunderstood. <laughs> you think? Um. So maybe a Thursday and Wednesday, like the last set. If we did the second and the eighth. Do we? So do we do we want do we think a Saturday would be advantageous would pick up a a different demographic than during the week? I think potentially. Are you anticipating about two hours? Hour and a half. I think an hour yeah, and a half I think makes an hour sense. Half will do it. I think that the that Lexington was two hours, but they did that long presentation. presentation. Like they did our whole informational session first, and then the maps. And the planner advised us not to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so. so I have a conflict on the Thursday, the second that evening. We could do that Saturday day or Wednesday night. Is two nights out hard for people if they do Halloween on 31st and then Wednesday the next night, the first? So, um, so Wednesday the 8th? And I, I'm, the 7th oh, is Wednesday election day. First, yeah. yeah, the 7th is election day. Okay. To, election Tuesday. I'm fortunate that following week, I'm conflicted the 8th, 9th, and 10th with work events. And we have planning board on the 6th. So maybe we go the following week. Yeah. 
Yeah, the eighth works better for me personally. If we're doing it Wednesday. Wednesday, Thursdays aren't good at the senior center. They're not good. No. Oh, it's both Wednesdays and Thursdays. I thought you said no oh, Thursdays. So just Thursdays are bad. Thursday. Okay. Thursdays. They have so Wednesdays a, are good. Wednesdays are good. Okay. What about Wednesday the eighth? They're wide open on their other days. I'm conflicted. You're conflicted. Yep. On the eighth. I'm going to try the next week. Don't so Wednesday the fifteenth. Um, well, I don't need to be there as long as other people can do it, I guess. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't it, it totally opens up versus um but then the following week is thanksgiving so probably should do the week of the sixth and the week of the 13th unless you want to squeeze one in on yeah it's a tough one tough time of the year do we do the saturday the 28th or are we not doing sad i'm i'm um i'm at boston college that day <laughs> <laughs> football game it's a football game <laughs> um again it doesn't have to be around my schedule but if we could i mean even if we could do if you did the eighth the first and the eighth or something like that if we ended up doing two wednesdays i could do the first just couldn't do the eighth and then you could do the eighth but couldn't do the first so you and i could swap out uh if we could get like three and three So we're gonna were we gonna try for Saturday or I think just we're gonna try for co we to make try. that work. Does the fourth work for anybody? It doesn't work for me. Does the eleventh work for anybody? It's it's Veterans Veterans Day. Day. Does that uh, matter? So maybe Saturdays are out just because of the yeah the time of year is not good for Saturdays. Well, why do we have to do this now? I mean, we're not going to be doing the public hearings until January, right? Well, I think that we need to know where where we're going to do the overlays in order to be able to write the uh, bylaw. Yeah, and the legal ad and all that good stuff. You're going to want to lay out where. Yeah, I feel you. You need. So, is the second out um, November second? It's a Thursday. Yeah, it's senior Thursday. Thursday. Oh, that's right. it stays out. Uh, It'll be tough getting people there on a Friday. Yes. I think. And the fourth is out. So then we have the sixth. I think we might be just best served skipping the Saturdays and going Wednesday the first and Wednesday the eighth. That's good for me. Can you make either of those? Um I can make the eighth. Okay. Right now I can do like both of those personally. With some pain, but still do it. <laughs> I could do the first. I could do both the first and the eighth. I'm good for both, too. What time? What well, do you think, 6.30? Or do you want to do a... So do you want to do like we did before, one five thirty, one six thirty? Okay. Which one's which? The first at 5.30? I'm, uh, I don't have a preference. Yeah, I don't have a preference. That works for me. First at 5.30? Yep. That works. First at 5.30, Lisa, yep. does that work? It does, thank you. And then the 8th at 6.30. And I'd be happy again once the um, <clears throat> flyers are done for this to get them in the electronic backpacks for the school again as well. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Great, thanks. So are we going to... um? Mm -hmm. Do our own printing for that flyer. Yeah, right. Yeah, we'll yeah. Because I have a list of people I can send to. We're just gonna do electronic. Yeah, we'll just do like we did before. We don't have to do the townwide. The email list and the if news. Be, I'll I'll send out news and announcements. The flat and uh, in the e flash. And I can send it to the town meeting reps again. That, that yeah. wasn't a big deal. And the school back town meeting reps. Oh, I'm sorry. And my Southboro. <laughs> Being attendees, the frequent flyers. Okay, that's, a, yeah, yeah, that would be good. Like just a little Cardi thing. I think that was effective. Yeah. We have the funding to do that. You're not mailing. You, we're just. It's just postage. We're going to make. Oh, I mean, you'll have my time we'll, when the, the flyer. Time. 
Are you going to mail the card? Is that what you're we were saying? saying to the yeah. frequent flyers to town meetings? Oh, yeah. Okay. I Those are the ones I stuck with. I wasn't papers. following the lingo. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking frequent flyer. <laughs> I'm like, what? No, it's the, the regular attendees, the people that show up at town meeting. Yeah. That, town meeting voters. Yeah. So, oh, Colleen, right. you and I create that thing again, and I'll have Reagan create it on PDF. Okay. And I'll just, I'll get some um, cardstock. We'll do the printing here ourselves. Perfect. Yeah. Because we do have funding for specific you know for, for these tasks yeah so if you do want to send it to the printer we can do that too if it's advantageous time wise okay think about it but you know depending on how, how many in the list for the town meeting voters when you did it last time so i think i um without literally counting i think i did about 800 yeah so that's a lot i mean print on the on the town machine so we'll have to figure out if we maybe just send it to the printer I, I mean, it's. I have the list, so yeah. the list is there. It's not like you know. I mean, we could have it printed, and I could do the stickers and throw it out. They yeah, post maybe it. that. Just the printing. Okay. I'm thinking the printing itself is. You and I can figure that part intensive. out. Intensive, yeah. Okay, we can do that. Okay. Anything else on this, Lisa? Anything else on this? No, Mimi. Thank you. Anybody in the room here want to comment on? MBTA. And we have seven attendees in the Zoom waiting room. And um, anyone on Zoom, if you have a comment on this, if you raise your hand. No hands raised right now. Okay. Thanks, Colleen, for all your work on this. Yeah, Thank Colleen. You. The next item on the agenda is the Public Works Planning Board, Public Works Advisory Committee. Do you want to introduce us to this one, Debbie? I will. Thanks, Mimi. Um, so um, one of the select board goals was to abolish the Public Works Planning Board. And after a number of discussions, um, a small committee was put together to entertain the idea of a uh, replacing the PWPB with the Public Works Advisory Committee. So um, this is being led by Sam Stivers on the select board. And Tim, Mr. Tim Litt was assigned to um, <laughs> help, but that's not even the right word. <laughs> Lassoed. <laughs> <laughs> um, support uh, the effort. And um, I'm kind of the third wheel, I'll say. Um, so Tim is here to give a presentation of uh, the enormous amount of work and thought that he's put into, and time, that he's put into um, this kind of complicated uh, situation. Um, he's gonna give an update on um, the, the current thinking and some of the um, conversations that he's already started to have with some of our stakeholders. So I'll introduce Actually, him. Let later. me share my screen, I can do this, please. So while that's being set up, you know, over the past few months, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the status and the um, fate of uh, the current Public Works Planning Board and the Tree Warden, both here and uh, at the Select Board and a few other places as well. So I think most of you were present in this room when the Select Board voted to revise its FY24 goal of abolishing the Public Works Planning Board. They assigned it, as, as uh, Mr. Muria said, to uh, Selectman Stivers, and with your encouragement, voted <laughs> to ask uh, her and, and, and me to develop the, the details. So um, you're a bit ahead of the curve, but what I'd like to do this evening is to make sure that everyone's on the same page on this, because you know it's, it's, it's been kind of fragmented, and, and you hear different things in different places, and I just want to get one story straight. So this is the first time I think that there'll be a coherent story told in a public forum. So if you'll excuse me, when I tell you things you already know, it's to try and get the whole story um, out. So I have two short slide sets. And the first one is um, uh, one that we've been using as we consult with the stakeholders, you being one of them. So if I can share my screen here. 
This one. Okay, so um, you, the point on, on on this one is to sort of go through the the what, why, and how of of, of what's going on, um, and it it represents the three of us. We are we are by the way not a committee. Sam owns this. We're unofficial helpers, or uh, something like that. Okay, so in terms of background, um, I think we all know that the Department of Public Works has a pretty big impact on the town budget and, and services, one of the smaller, one of the larger um, parts of town. Um, many of the stakeholders expect the Public Works Planning Board to have an active role. Um, so the Public Works Planning Board was created by a special act of the legislature, which is chapter 447, Act of 1991, which also created the DPW from cemetery, highway, and water, and abolished the, the office of tree warden and replaced it by the select board, and entertaining a little bit of uh, legislative sleight of hand. Um, so special acts are the legislature's response to home rule petitions that come from cities and towns. And once you have one, modifying it requires another home rule petition, an act of the legislature to do hopefully what you want. So home rule petitions have to be authorized by town meeting. The select board submits them to and negotiates with the legislature on behalf of the town. The legislature's response is not guaranteed. It's likely not quick. It's cumbersome. And the legislature, plus or minus some guardrails I'm going to put in, can modify, reject, delay, ignore, or maybe even do what we want. So um, it's pretty clear that change is needed. The current Public Works Planning Board's mission is not terribly clear if you actually read the, um, the special act and it's disputed, which is part of why the stakeholders are upset. So initially, if you read the text, it was to advise the select board or then board of selectmen on planning, managing and financing of the town. That's literally what it says. So implicit in that is it's limited to public works, meaning work done by the DPW you know, that language might make you think that it was supposed to duplicate the advisory committee, but it's not, at least that wasn't the intent. Um, and it was intended to represent town meeting as town meeting was implementing its vote to create the uh, DPW. There was also, a, after town meeting, there was also a, a ballot initiative to confirm it. Um, so this, this view of it is supported by the structure where the moderator, part of the legislature of town meeting has the majority it's also supported by the recollections of those of us who were there. I was in town meeting, John Butler was involved in this. Um, we both uh, have the same view of this. Now, some of the mem current members, uh, particularly the chair, believe that the mission has largely been accomplished and so not much happens. So currently there is pressure from a number of the stakeholders, you're one of them, um, to initiate guidance on priorities, long-term planning projects, and to respond to public concerns. Um, but in fact, the board rarely meets, it's passive, and many of the stakeholders are dissatisfied. The other thing I'll say is that the select board has not been a good tree warden. Um, they don't have enough time to do the, do the job right. Now that we're a town over 10,000, the members are not qualified arborists, which state law requires, absent this special act. Um, tree City and other initiatives want more expertise, I think, from the tree warden, not less. And the select board just isn't equipped to do that. The other thing I'll say is, you know, it's a job for one person, not a part-time job for five that already are doing the select board job as a part-time uh, effort. None of this comes as news to the select board. I think they would agree with all of that. So to work on this, um, we will need in, in 2024 some town meeting articles. So as, as you've heard, the select board goals for FY24 include abolishing the Public Works Planning Board, which requires a town meeting vote, then action by the select board, action by the legislature. And because it modifies the same special act, 
Um, I've argued both here and at the select board that it should be bundles of reforming the three wardens. If you're gonna touch something, do it all at once and get it over with. So under the uh, plan, the Public Works Planning Board will be replaced by a bylaw or a standing committee, which I hope is designed to meet stakeholder expectations. Um, I know you folks and the select board both support a replacement, so it's not just abolish, it's do something um, that will better meet the stakeholders' uh, expectations. And the nice thing about a bylaw uh, committee is that future town meetings can restructure it, can evolve the charge, and we no longer have to go to the state with mommy may I, which is what we have to do um, for the special act. Not only that, uh, going to town meeting is a whole lot faster than trying to go to town meeting, go to the select board, <laughs> go to the legislature and you know waiting for the wheels to turn. So um, stakeholders, um, I think, you know, the select board obviously is one. I consider you as one both because of the nature of, of the work, um, but also because you were the, one of the appointing authorities for the current Public Works Planning Board. So we don't wanna change something out from under you if you're unhappy with the way it happens. Uh, the DPW superintendent, of course, and citizens have all been making noises about things that this board ought to be doing something about. So there are two actions required by town meeting to make this go forward. The first one, and the numbers will change, but as far as this project goes, I'm calling the first one Article 1, um, and that is to authorize a home rule petition to modify and replace uh, Chapter 447 Acts of 1991, the Special Act. And Article 2 says, okay, we'll establish the replacement committee. So um, to go a little bit deeper into these, um, Article 1 initiates the amendment of the Special Act in order to reestablish the Office of Tree Warden, which liberates the select board and also establishes um, the criteria consistent with state law. Um, it dissolves the Public Works Planning Board. And because town meeting decided to rename the Board of Selectmen, we'll fix that in the Special Act too while we're, while we're at it. You know, while you're at it. I know I'd get yelled at if I didn't. <laughs> so, um, so basically what, what the language of this um, uh, does is it authorizes the select board to prepare and submit a home rule petition to the legislature to effect the amendment. It leaves the replacement committee to the town because we want control over it. And that's what Article 2 looks like. So what Article 2 says is once the Public Works Planning Board is dissolved by the state, it establishes what I'm calling the Public Works Advisory Committee, which will be a standing bylaw committee. And you can call it the PWAC if you like. Um, it's designed to meet our current needs and, and expectations. As I say, it can be updated. And it replaces the Public Works Planning Board, the Solid Waste Disposal Committee, which I don't think has ever been staffed or met in the past five years anyway. And, but it belongs with Public Works uh, Advisory. And it also, um, it turns out that we had a green technologies a committee whose responsibilities were transferred to the Public Works Planning Board. So we'll take those on too, so that you know they're not left uh, stranded. The idea is to have it work with advisory, capital, planning, and then some of the clients, uh, Trails and Recreation and others as, as necessary. And both Trails and Recreation make a lot of use of DPW for doing work. And so I imagine that you know the budgeting and the planning and the project review will all sort of uh, overlap. Um, so it's currently at, at five voting members. I'm going back and forth. The majority seems to think five. I'm not sure if it should be five or seven, but it's one of those two. Um, a minimum of three have some um, professional background. I'm not specifying what that is in the bylaw, but the kinds of things I have in mind are people like civil engineers or landscape architects or environmental uh, engineers or specialists, retired DPW people, people who have some idea of you know, what the work is because you don't want a purely um, 
you know, sort of random selection of people, but you also want to make sure that there is the opportunity for uh, at large, you know, representation from the public. So that's why I made it, you know, just a portion of the board. Um, and then uh, ex officio, the DPW superintendent, and I uh, was thinking that the town planner would be a good addition so that, you know, you have some uh, insight into what's going on. Hey, I knew you'd like me for that. Um, but the idea is that there, everyone's appointed, aside from the ex officio members, by the select board. Um, that seems to fit the notion of it being uh, DPW. And frankly, when we have multiple appointing authorities, it gets to be kind of busy and difficult to coordinate to get the right balance of people. And it doesn't seem like something that um, it's, it's worth fragmenting, but of course, you know, if you have an opinion, happy to hear it. Um, the idea is that it advises the select board and the uh, superintendent of public works. It is to assist with establishing priorities and long-term planning for significant public works projects. Significant is an important word there. Um, it may evaluate or develop options to be considered for projects that deviate from their plans and scope, expense, or schedule. Uh, you can think of some of the things that have happened recently where you would have wished to have more people looking at it. Um, it may also assist in locating or evaluating the desirability of external funding like grants. Um, you can imagine where we've gotten into trouble for not having enough eyes on grants in the past. Um, and it becomes a focal point for communications to and from the public about projects, including project notices, hearings, transparency, Again, if we can offload hearings from the select board so that at least the first level of them uh, happen here, they're more likely to get a, uh, a thorough hearing and the select board doesn't need the work. They can always have a hearing if they want to. Important point is that it does not manage or direct the superintendent of public works, employees or projects. It's purely an advisory uh, committee and the idea is to help with the big picture. So that's, you know, in, six or seven slides, sort of uh, where we are, or, or what I'm trying to do. And the other set of slides talks about where we are. If you want to do questions on this first, we can do that. You can let me go on. Mr. Stein. Great job, Mr. Lip. <clears throat> Thank you very much for taking the uh, project on in conjunction with uh, Mr. Maria and Mr. Stivers. Um, so the tree warden, would that be an appointed? It will, it will be per uh, Mass General Laws, what is it, 106, 40, something or other. Um, it's appointed by the Board of Selectmen, and the state law that I reference um, requires that the tree warden be a qualified uh, arborist and have a pesticide license. And... And there's a budget implication for that. So would that would the tree warden be like a contracted? It's I, I'm not going to prescribe that. It could be a contractor. It could be an employee. It could be part time employee. It could be a full time employee. That's up to the selectmen and advisory through the budget process. But the idea is is that it's someone who is qualified. You'll notice also that the state law allows it uh, for there being deputy tree wardens. So is that something that we might want to refine those de those types of details? So I don't want to put that into the bylaw. I think that will come out of the budget uh, process and it's something that may change over time. I mean, we may start uh, with a contractor and finding that you know it's a 10 hour a week job. And then as people dig into it, we may find you know, in three years or five years that it's a full-time job. I don't know, and it doesn't seem like something to hard code. So my my feedback to that is, if we're going to say that the select board has not fulfilled the role, we really would want to know. If, I think that the town is going to say, well, what is the role? What is the requirement? What does this mean? Sure. And be more likely to support um, this initiative 
if we are able to quantify that and well i think that's a, that's that's nail it down that's a question we can ask and maybe um uh, mr murio who's our co-op and look at what other towns are doing uh can find out you know how much time uh they're spending on, on this sort of thing but again yeah. i don't think it's a bylaw question so much as a uh, budget and personnel board and you know that sort of thing um, so and the tree warden would be reporting to the board of selectmen or to the to the superintendent of dpw so the way i have it um uh, written is that he's appointed by the board of selectmen and uh, is supervised by this dpw superintendent because the two are are intertwined and the board of selectmen are not good you know day-to-day um, -day managers they're good at setting policy and and sorting out disputes so like who would be doing like the annual review of the tree ward i would expect that to be the dpw superintendent hmm. and i would expect that if um stakeholders are not happy or are, or conversely are extremely happy then they would be you know solicited for feedback in the normal performance appraisal process um so just going back to um the notion of uh, the stakeholders. Sure. We were talking about select board, planning board, and mm -hmm. residents. I didn't hear advisory. Just out of curiosity, where do they fit into the scheme of things here? And so, pardon my ignorance. I don't. I don't know what advisory has had to do with the current public works planning board if any well the current public works planning board hasn't met in years so no one's had much to do with it fair uh, um seriously um i guess in principle or in principle the what i'm looking at what here is you know i expect advisory to be to be involved through the normal budget process you know because both advisory and capital look at the larger dpw projects and and what's going on um and they both will make recommendations you know to town meeting again through the budget process but i don't think they're um, I, I think they're concerned about the finance but i don't think they're stakeholders in the outcomes of the project by and large okay thanks very much sure good stuff Ms. Houlihan. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Mr. Litt. Appreciate your time and attention to this. I guess I'm on the same wavelength with um, Jesse regarding appointment of the the um, town warden and um, tree warden. Um, and what about thinking about instead of an appointment, either contractor or employee? Well, you can appoint language. You can appoint a contractor. I mean, the fact that it, that that the tree warden is appointed by the selectmen is what's in the state statute, you know, absent our, our special act. So it basically says, you know, for a town where the town is, uh, for a town, the tree warden is appointed by the selectmen and for a town greater than 10,000, there are some qualifications that the appointee must have. That doesn't prevent um, the selectmen from appointing a contractor I mean, that's that's done with uh, other jobs in the town. So, again, we're not locking in one way or the other. But it, you lock out an employee with an appointment. No, I mean, you know, our, our current uh, tree warden designee is an employee who is appointed. I mean, the selectmen appoint employees uh, all the time. I mean, our our town manager, Mark Purple, is uh, appointed as the purchasing officer for the town. I guess I'm meaning that we would, ra like, I guess I'd prefer an employee of the town to be the tree warden versus an appointed, like, I wouldn't want to just say just because someone has an arborist, we're going to appoint them the tree warden. I'd rather have that an employee and a, you interview for the position. Well, mo the selectmen do interview for for most of their appointments, um, and that's you know certainly feedback. But I don't think we can require that without 
Um, well, we need a budget. Well, without, without, well, there are a couple of things. I mean, one is I'm trying very hard to fit the tree warden back into the way the state wants tree wardens to work. So, you know, we don't have special things to worry about. And the way this, the, the state works is the tree warden is appointed by the selectmen. Now, we anyone can, can certainly go to the selectmen and say, gosh, we really think there's enough work here for it to be an employee and that should happen. And then you go to the personnel board and you, you try and justify the position from a structural point of view and you go to advisory to say, yep, we've got to get the budget for it. And then you have a tree warden and maybe a deputy tree warden and maybe a junior tree warden auxiliary or you know, whatever else we, we need. But it's not something, I, I think that's more a policy question than it is a by law. How we make the, the law work for us. Yeah, that's fair enough. Okay, thank you. Sure. Well, Ms. DeMaria. Well, I just wanted to add a couple of things. Is that I was, this is the one point I was stuck on. I mean, on balance, we really want something that passes um, at town meeting. So, um, you know, I, I think that I understand um, Mr. Litt's perspective and also Mr. Stiver's in feeling like we shouldn't focus so much on um, on the tree warden. But I, I I will tell you other other towns do other things. Um, there's a there's a sentiment that's that runs through our town that you can have a pesticide license and take an online course and you're trained in arboriculture. And I think that's not what being a tree city USA is about, not being what a green community is about. And for small towns like ours that are trying to retain the the, the beauty uh, and the scenic nature, we've heard again and again that we really want to step up this activity. So I'm a little bit torn about that as well. Um, at some point in time, when we brought on um, Christina Bizanson to come and speak with us, I asked her what she felt about that because she's been a municipal tree warden before and she also teaches arboriculture. Um, and um, she told me that when she worked for a municipal, which I think was in um, maybe Virginia or, or Maryland, um, she worked for uh, either the Parks and Rec Department or the Planning Board. So in other communities, th there are ways, you know, they do things differently because it, it resolves the problem of conflict. So I love that idea, to be honest. I don't know whether Southboro is ready for that. Um, but I, I don't think that, you know, when I do a search, I go online and I look to see who has what kind of license in town. I have a pharmacy license and I look to see what does everybody else have? There's a hundred or more people with a pesticide. Drivers, pesticide, but that doesn't make them an arborist. So, and the way that the law is written is they must be trained in arbor culture. And so that's even more nebulous. That means that what, they take a class? And so I am troubled by that. And if the planning board has um, troubles with that too, I'm kind of proud of that. Um, because I think that if we leave it to the select board to say, hey, here's a 40 hour employee, but you know we'll carve out some of that person's job because they just did an online course. I don't think that's what the people of South Pro are really looking for. So that's kind of the part that I, I have difficulty with. And I think that there also is a conflict with a, a tree warden reporting to DPW. And maybe I'm soured by what has happened in town over the last year. So I don't know, um, you know, maybe that's not, it, it, maybe it was not the way that most towns do it. But I, I did take on that piece to, to take a look at and see what other towns are doing. Um, and so uh, I, I will do that. But I, the idea of trying to keep it a little bit kind of um, according to law was really because we are looking to uh, get something passed at town meeting. So we don't want to make that the controversial part. So, so I'll, I'll add a couple of things yeah. to, to that. One is that the tr most of the powers of the tree warden do not come from the town or from the selectmen. They come from state law. Um, so I mean, he had, the tree warden has all a collection of, of authorities. Uh, what is it? Chapter 87 and, and, and friends. Um, 
sort of the, the second thing I'll say is that I think it would be very reasonable for for those of you who have you know, strong opinions about what the job ought to be to work on you know a job description that says you know these are the qualifications we think uh, should be uh, considered in appointing a tree warden. You know, in the same way that people get together and say, this is what we're looking for in an IT manager or an account, you know, a, a treasurer or whatever. Um, and I, I mean, I can't speak for the, for the select board, but by and large, they're reasonable people. So if you go to them with a, you know, a thoughtful um, uh, presentation and uh, say, you know, here it is, I think they will, they will ask the obvious question, you know, what does it cost? How many hours? You know, is there is it better to contract? Is it better to have an employee? Um, but you can certainly uh, drive the this is what the job ought to be and what the qualifications ought to be, you know, in terms of detailing that nebulous thing in state law that says trained in, in, in uh, arbor culture. I mean, I had an uncle who was a horticulturalist, and I can tell you, you know, what. If I looked it up, I could tell you, you know, what schools he went to and what degrees he got. And it wasn't, I mean, there wasn't online at the time, but it, it wasn't a magazine correspondence course. It was, you know, a serious degree. So I think that's a reasonable thing to, you know, to add. But I, again, I don't think that's something that we want to put in the bylaw as a way to get there. Ms. Braccio? Thank you. Um, thank you, Tim. Thank you, for, uh, Deb and Sam. Um, I guess I'm in a, a little bit of a different mindset. I think looking at it from a cost perspective, um, granted, we know that there have been tremendous issues in the past, but I think we've all worked very hard to kind of perfect a process, if you will. Um, as far as the, the tree warden goes, we have the ability to have a arborist look at trees, that we need to have an arborist look at trees. When I, I think about the cost of actually hiring an arborist for just this, I think that's going to be a real hard sell at town meeting. And I think, um, again, we've got a, a process in place. You know, it's, it's paid through a stipend through that's um, uh, listed in the uh, SAP. And again, I just worry about, you know, whose definition of qualified are we going to use as well? Again, I, I look at the job that uh, Mr. Leroy has done, you know, in the last few public hearings that we've had and how smoothly they've gone. And, um, you know, a lot of time and effort went into getting to this point. So I just want to be cognizant of that. And um, I, I do think that the cost is, is going to be a factor. And I understand we're a tree city and, you know, that, that trees have become a very important issue. Um but I just want to make sure we don't shut the door as well on an employee um, that I think could fill this role as well. So thank you. I, I will say that, that that I had that conversation in terms of the management challenge with uh, you know the current tree warden designee with Phil Condon. And, um, you know, I think, you know, exactly what one does um, there is, you know, something that he's going to have to think about and 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 uh, come up with an answer for. Um, he probably doesn't fit our de current definition of, you know, a trained arborist, horticulturalist, whatever. But, you know, um, does it be, you know, does it become something that, you know, he is the number one helper, he's the organizer, he takes care of the things that he's good at. Um, or does he do something completely different? I mean, that's a management question and it's not something I think, you know, for us to um, go after. And let's see. Is it my turn? I think it's your turn. <laughs> um, thank you, Tim, Debbie and Sam. Um, very thorough. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> just to clarify, the state does not require an arborist. It requires 
uh, tree warden shall be qualified by training and experience in the field of arboriculture and licensed by the Department of Food and Agriculture in accordance with the provisions of Section 10. That's the uh, pesticides. the pesticides. I think that I think that's consistent with what I've said. Well, you said the state required an arborist for. No, I said someone trained in in arboriculture. I'll I'll listen to the playback. Okay. If, if that's not what I said. That's what I meant. <laughs> so, so as Lisa said, that's difficult to define. Qualified by training and experience in the field of arboriculture, and I and I would argue that I think that we had um, bad management, and I think that the tree warden designee was not allowed to do his job in the past, and from. I've been very involved in all the tree hearings and walked um, with Mr. Leroy to all the trees. I find him to be very knowledgeable in um, anything that we had a question with. We had the arborist, um, so it's easy to get an arborist to help us out. And I would question whether there's enough work to have a full-time arborist on staff, because I think Christina, when she was, she worked at, in a big city. And um, yeah. You would split towns. I think even um, Westboro has a part time. They split, I think they split it with another town, a half time position or something. Maybe not Westboro, but some several of the towns. Um, well, I think Westboro, it's their DPW superintendent who's their tree warden, yeah. who Christina spoke very highly of. Okay. So some some towns have a part time position; it doesn't have to be full time. Yeah. And, and by the way, some towns have a model where that person also does tree work. You have to remember that the cost of what we're spending to chop down trees or cut limbs—I don't know what that is—but in some towns, they do it internally within the town. That's part of the job. So I think when we look, and we're not going to look at the cost, but when one is to look at the cost they really need to look at the whole thing of what can be done by buying a cherry picker or a piece of equipment where you can do a lot of the work yourself and that's what christina did. and i well i wonder what the liability insurance would be well, they're insured yeah of course yeah so i think great job and i agree i think that we can you know write a policy to get more specific in what we want the the you know tree warden to to do but I think that keeping it broad in the in the bylaw is uh, is the correct path to take. Yeah, I think it would be a job description rather than policy. And so, or a job description. So, so these won't these two slides won't take terribly uh, long. But these are just this is just an update on so where are we where are we what have we done so far? Somebody wants to ask a question. Can they ask a question first? I make a statement? Sure. Freddie Gillespie, I'm speaking as a private citizen, but I was um, out at Breakneck Hill Conservation Land today in my role as the steward for the conservation, um, Breakneck Hill Conservation Land, as well as last week I was at the um, hot zone for the newly documented spotted lanternfly in Fayville. And the, as you may know, through the master plan, the Open Space Preservation Commission has been charged with managing all the invasive species in the town of Southboro, or not managing them, but coming up with plans and dealing with them, plants, animals, insects, anything. So anyhow, I saw the infestation in um, Fayville, and it was literally as bad as anything you've ever seen on any horror movie spotted lanternfly infestation and it was only on a couple of trees. So then today we're out at Breakneck Hill, we're dealing with some um, invasive removal of the tree of heaven. And while I'm there coming through the woods on a trail as a man who looked official, I said, you look official. And he said he was the USDA coming to look at our, he had spotted some tree of heaven out on the Breakneck Hill and with some spotted lanternfly. So a little while later, I'm underneath the invasive tree of heaven which attracted the spotted lanternfly, which is gonna damage your um, apple and grapes and other agricultural uses, which is why USDA and also the Department of Agriculture Resources who we're working with are involved. So I'm standing under the tree of heaven 
with spotted lanternfly at my shoulder and I looked down on the ground and there's the telltale signs of, and I checked it and it was the um, invasive jumping worms, which will actually take out trees because they, they destroy the soil and trees will tip over in addition to other problems. So right there, that's, you know, one, I was just in a small area and I'm telling you this because between that and the emerald ash borer, which is gonna take out every single ash tree. We've got also beech um, trees are having a blight. Apple trees are having a blight. We are in an unprecedented time, Never mind the typical, you know, older trees on the roads. We are in mm -hmm. unprecedented time of really, um, we have no idea what the, what the impact to our native trees are. And you're going to be seeing this. So I urge you to be very careful as you seem to be in deciding what role you want your um, an arborist to take on because it's not the role of your it's everything has changed and it changed you know it's been changing but um, this is this is you'd have to see it to believe it and you know we're all going to be witnessing it with in the very near future so I thank you for your your care but I think you also have to look into the fact we are going to be losing an awful lot of our trees and you combine that with um, flooding and drought, other stresses, and you know, we, we have to be thoughtful and planning. And as these trees come down, what are we going to do? And there needs to be a bigger plan than the Open Space Preservation Commission can come up with. So I hope we can all work together on this. Thank you. Can you grab the uh, camera back there on your right? Um, so in terms of, and I think. I think you know uh, what what uh, Freddie just said is is important in terms of sizing uh, the role, but I don't think it impacts you know what we're trying to do in terms of of getting back to a an active functioning organization on on both of these fronts. So, in terms of what we've managed to get done so far, um, we've refined, abolished the Public Works Planning Board into as I've discussed, you know, amend the special act replace the Public Works Planning Board. And uh, we have a team of people who's working on it. There is a project plan, which I don't uh, display externally. You'll see the timeline in a little bit. And there are draft articles uh, for town meeting that go through the, the details and all the funny uh, legal language. Uh, I believe those are in your Dropbox if you wanna look at them. I'm not sure you wanna spend time on them uh, this evening, but be happy to talk about them. Um, there's also uh, a draft petition to the legislature that's not required until we uh, get through town meeting. Um, and that will probably change some more with legal review. So I'm not exposing that at the moment, uh, but it's basic work is done for that as well. And as you can tell, we have uh, presentations uh, to try and tell people about what's going on. I also spent about an hour or so in detail uh, with all of those documents with Bill uh, Cundiff. Um He was very supportive about it. He had a couple of, of uh, questions, which I answered. Um, and he was already saying, well, gee, I could use a committee like this for, and he start, started going down the list and the, and the problems he had that he thought this would be helpful for. Um, so he's definitely on board and supportive, and I think that's uh, useful. Um, we're continuing in terms of next steps, we're continuing to review and refine and we've got a few open issues we're working. Um, the documents you know, do get updated. Um, hopefully sometime soon, I'll get permission to talk to town council about this and get, you know, we'll, we'll have the style points discussion about, you know, and is, it a, is it a comma and is it a whence or a wherefore? Um, and we also will need to uh, engage with uh, Senator Eldridge and Representative Donahue um, because um, uh, once this is approved, uh, petition ends up, what you wanna have end up is a bill introduced in both the House and the Senate at the same time. And it then goes through this long uh, process. In terms of you know key dates, the warrant, as you may remember, opens on December 12th and closes on February 6th. So I'm trying to make sure that we're well in ahead of, of that process. And then there will be some public education. So if you look at the way the legislature works, 
Um, it works on two year cycles starting in odd years. And um, given that town meeting is going to be in, in next year in 2024, the attorney general might get around to, you know, uh, looking at some of this stuff in August or um, uh, September, and sometimes even later than that. Odds are the right thing to do is to submit the petition to the, to the legislature in around January of 2025. And then we'll see, you know, if they take the full two years, if they do it in the first week, I don't know. But that's the reason for engaging the senator and, and the representative um, is A, to get it on their horizon, B, to make sure that as best we can, what we submit to them is what they want to see rather than have to go back and forth with multiple iterations. The way the, the bylaw is, is, is written is that it takes effect after attorney general review and after the special act is amended. Doesn't really matter what order that happens in, but it's likely to be that way. So here's the um, sort of the timeline that, that I've laid out for this. Uh, you can see the second you know, uh, bullet from the, from the right is I'm here talking with you. And uh, sort of next up is going to be uh, advisory and capital if they're willing to talk to me. And then we'll continue on to the, to the other stakeholders. Um, there'll be final uh, legal review by the time the warrant closes on uh, February 6th. And then hopefully with your help and the help of others, we'll have the challenge of voter education so that town meeting is a smooth uh, process. Once town meeting has uh, voted, I don't believe Article 1 needs approval by the Attorney General, although I'll check on that. Um, it just authorizes the selectmen to do something. It's not a bylaw. Um, then the select board has to vote to submit the home rule petition. There may be some negotiation with the legislature as it goes through the three readings and committee processes in both places and reconciliation and all that stuff. Um, and hopefully at the, the legislature then enacts it and then we get to appoint members and get it to work. And that is what I have for you this evening. I do thank you for your engagement and your attention. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything else for Tim? Tim, do you know why the select board was tree warden? Like it seems to make very little sense. Well, what I what I know is that um, there was there was sort of this this question of if you're going to merge DPW. Uh, what do you do with tree warden because all the equipment is there and the budget is is there and the special act merges that in. It's not actually clear. I don't think the special act was particularly well drafted. Um, I mean, you see that in the, in the in the definition of the public works planning board, and you sort of see it when you start looking at how the tree warden stuff works. So it's not immediately clear to me that they really intended the Board of Selectmen to be the tree warden. Because um, I don't, the board didn't appear to know until recently. Yeah, 2021 or 2019 or something. Yeah. I, I can't give you a rational reason why that might have been. Um, I did by chance uh, sit next to um, our former town council uh, at a recent meeting and asked him if he'd been involved with any of this because I had that question and a few others. And he very carefully went through his dates and he says, well, I was a selectman and that ended before this thing happened. And then I was town council and that happened after. Oh, so he, <laughs> so he just he, right he fit the in the little wedge there, huh? <laughs> I, was, I was hoping for answers, but there aren't any on, from him on that. Thank you. Thank you, Sam and Debbie. Good work. Yeah. The only thing I was going to say is I think in the Dropbox, we did put a copy of the Warren articles. Um, and at some point, I think that we probably would want the... Um, I don't think you're going to come back again, Tim, are you? I can come back. 
yeah, I mean, at some point we want to make sure that we're happy. The planning board is happy with the wording in the articles. And so we'll have to put that on a future topic. Do you have comments on, on, on the wording or the details of that? Um, send them um, to Mr. Murray or send them to me and, you know, we'll work on that. Um, I would you know, hope that, you know, when we get a bit closer to town meeting that uh, a few folks would uh, take a vote that says, you know, you support this so that we can put that out in front of people. So wouldn't there be public hearings? Um, no, this doesn't require a public hearing. It, it as a warrant article, it will go before the, um, the advisory committee uh, formally, uh, this, because it's a selectman's article, you know, they will discuss it. I don't know that they'll um, choose to have a hearing on it. And, you know, what I've done in the past with, you know, this is not the first time that I've created a committee for the town. Um, what I've done in the past for the ones that seemed interesting enough is, you know, held a forum at the library and in some of their, you know, public information sessions. I think the question on this one and something for you folks to think about is, gee, you know, how engaged are people going to be in this particular issue? I mean, it's something that you all are, are very passionate about uh, for good reason. It's something that um, I picked up because it didn't seem like it was on the right course <laughs> um, a while ago. But, you know, I'm not sure if this is going to be one of those, oh yes, you know, everyone's in favor, we'll go vote for it things, or if they're going to be people who are somehow passionate against it for some reason. That I don't, I don't know where we are on that yet. True enough. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anything else on this? Next item: public hearing, St. Mark's School parking lot at St. Mark Street, major site plan. So just to give you a quick update, um, bottom line is that um, St. Mark's School has asked to continue without testimony the public hearing for major site plan approval. They're working on um, addressing the comments that Fuss and O'Neill provided, uh, which were predominantly related to lighting and the photometric plan. Um, in the meantime, from the last meeting that was continued, I've received um, um, an email from the building commissioner, Casey Brilling came. Um, he was asked by the applicant to opine on um, whether a special permit was required or not. And he um, um, opined that there would, um, a special permit is not required to go before the planning board for the parking of more than three spaces. Um, trying to just see here. Uh, yeah, so that satisfied the comment number one, but there were still six or seven comments related to lighting. Um, what else did we get here? Nope, oh, so that's it. So they did request, and we have an extension request signed by the applicant um, representative, Rob Kukowitz from St. Mark's School. So I'd like to make a motion that the board extend the decision deadline for 25 Marlboro Road major site plan approval for a parking lot for St. Mark's School to December 1st, 2023, and that we uh, continue this public hearing to our November 6th, 2023 meeting at 7 p.m. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, Luttrell, yes. Stein, yes. Willihan, yes. Demuria, yes. Braccio, yes. All right. And we just need a signature. That. Okay. 
Thank you. Next item. Next item on the agenda is a discussion item, residents at Park Central 40B. Uh, we could just do a recap of the hearing opening. Um, ZBA opened their hearing on October 11th. The um, proponent gave a presentation um, and there were many legal questions. Um, things that I'm still not uh, clear on. The One of the big things that came out is there's a covenant with the, the abutters, which um, questions whether they have control of that site because it uh, restricts the use of the land for a period of time. And it was unclear I guess town council wants to hear arguments from both sides. I don't know if, I don't know where we go from there. And I don't know how this plays out because I guess the next court hearing is December 20th and ZBA, their 180 days is over in April. So I'm not an attorney, but I think it's very unlikely that on December 20th, there'll be any decision on that. So it, will probably still be up in the air when the ZBA has to uh, make a decision. And I don't know if they can condition it. I, so that's one of my major questions. Um, the other issue was on the subdivision. Um, so Karina, David Williams, uh, Jay and I had talked briefly about the process and you know he was he felt very confident that you know the ZBA can do the subdivision as long as it's within the 40B locus but i don't think he had seen the preliminary subdivision plan so that he questioned a lot of that because it's you know 17 acres is within the the locus and they're subdividing 101 acres into six lots so I'm still not clear because he kept saying, I don't know if the planning board would waive that. So I'm still not clear if if we're getting subdivision or if CBA is. So that those were my major takeaways from the uh from the opening. Yeah, go ahead, Karina. Um so also just to let you know that uh Lara Davis, the um CBA admin, has set up a um a nice web page um, dedicated strictly to this project. So you should be able to find everything there. She also set it up that you can get e-alerts um, for anything new that gets posted there. So if anybody wants to stay on top of that, they can sign up for those. Um, number two, we also received um, a copy of an email from um, the recused ZBA member um, with concerns of uh, related to the covenant that exists there. Um, and that came from the ZBA, so that is likely on their website already. Um, and then thirdly, I was called um, by David Williams, the chair of the ZBA, um, on Friday last week. Um, and he was looking for some assistance to help find a peer review consultant. So what I did is I reached out to Fusson O'Neill, um, who's currently um, our town engineering consultant, and I sent them the information. Um, they're going to look at it and get back to me at the beginning of this week. Um, David is, I think, is out of, um, is not around for a couple weeks. He's on vacation. Um, so in the meantime, um, I had also asked, I had recommended to um, David Williams to reach out to town council because town council had said that he could recommend a couple of firms that he knows has the ability to do this as well. And um, he mentioned a couple consultants. So one of them I'll reach out to and send the information as well so they can get a jump start on it because I know they're eager to get um, a peer review consultant. And that consultant doesn't have to be procured. Um, they just need to um, formulate a contract in which the select board signs off on as the um, contract administrator for, that, for the ZBA. Um, so that's it. That's the update. 
So that's moving forward to, I, I guess at that meeting, they wanted the planning board to assist with the consultant or the planning department. So that's well on its way. Mr. Stein. Ms. Houlihan. Thanks. Um, yeah. I, so first of all, I thought the Zoning Bur Board of Appeals, um, the meeting was really well run. I think they are, you know, really prepared for this and um, seemingly collaborative and just the way that they've already um, had outreach and, and the way that David um, Williams, uh, the chair, is running that. So I was pleasantly surprised by the um not surprised, but relieved, I guess, that it's a collaborative process up front. Mimi, I would agree with you. Um, I was not in the room, but I was on the Zoom meeting. And I, I very, um, it almost was like a litigation happening amongst uh, the two attorneys in the room, one on the Zoom and, um, and our own town council. So I think there's quite a lot of legal questions. So hopefully they can figure that out because um, there is a worry. And I think uh, Miss Meath, summarized it nicely in her letter um, that there could be some town implications if we proceed with having these conversations, if it truly is, um, you know, the covenant is suggests that, you, that he can't have conversations with the town. So having some resolution will be important. Um, but I, I thought it was overall a, a very well run um, meeting. Mr. Maria. No, I have to agree as well, and I don't have any other comments. I, I found it fascinating uh, to watch, um, but there's a lot of legal questions. Some of them this board has already identified, and uh, we have to see how things play out. So thank you. I just wanted to mention quickly that the planning board was asked to attend via Zoom because there are uh, capacity limitations in the public safety room where the hearing was held. Otherwise, the planning board would have been there uh, in person. Uh, Ms. Braccio. Thank you. Nothing further to add. I agree with everything that's been said. Um, and hopefully, they'll just continue to move forward in the positive light um, and collaborating with the planning board as well. So that's all. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Freddie Gillespie, Chair of the Open Space Preservation Commission, and we have discussed this briefly. And one of the concerns that came up is, um, so I don't know how the, the law would play out, but to us with layman's knowledge that we have a 101 acre parcel or over, a little over, and there's no parcel for the 40B. So if you're going to subdivide that to create the 40B parcel, you know, it seems that that should be in front of the planning board. And then once the parcel's created, that parcel would get the 40B protection. And our interest is because when you do a subdivision, um, there's 10% set aside as open space. And then depending on what else is happening on the other parcels, there could even be more than 10%. And it would be how that 10% is set up in the language for the definition is, you know, coherent and you know, so it's not a little speck here and a little speck there. And, um, you know, the one 19.7 acres, that's about two acres versus out of the 10 that we would get approximately for 10%, right? But it makes a difference when you have a 10 acre parcel. And looking at the whole parcel, where's that going to be? And this also comes into play because there's another 40B coming up with the same situation of subdividing an existing parcel. And it, you know, I I know you're looking at it thoroughly, and one would hope that if the ZBA is the one doing the subdivision, that they would understand that the 40B exemption doesn't hold for the whole parcel. But to me, it doesn't seem like it should be put there because you're the board that is knowledgeable and experienced in subdivision. So why give it to a board that's not when the whole parcel isn't 40B? And that seems to be a problem we got into the last time that they were taking 40B exemptions for parcels, part of the project that wasn't 40B. Not being an attorney, I'm also concerned about the road going in the back if it's got 40B, and I raised this, this isn't an open space issue, so I'll step back on that. But um, I was at the site walk and I raised it at the very beginning. 
that you don't get exemptions for a road that opens up a property. The whole road has to be by the regular, it's not a 40B road, right? So it doesn't get the exemptions. It needs to go through the regular process. And it just seems early on, you should somebody should be deciding that the regular process needs to be followed for a project that's not a 40B project until you do these other things. You don't have a 40B parcel until you subdivide it. So I don't see how you can give an exemption to have the ZBA do the subdivision before it's actually a 40B parcel. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you. Thank you. We currently have six attendees in the Zoom room and no hands raised. I think I asked. Did I ask you, Lisa? She did. You did, Mimi. Thank you. Anything else on this? So I don't, I guess we just kind of stay on top of the, the subdivision and, and see what happens. That was the exact question that I asked town council. I'm not an attorney, but in my simple mind, it seemed to make sense that the subdivision would come to the planning board, would approve the subdivision, and then the ZBA could waive um, any regulations on the 40B locus that uh, made the project you know, difficult to construct. But as I said, I'm not an attorney. So we'll see. Um, evidently, our town council has significant concerns with what they put forth. So we'll see what happens there. I don't have anything else, do you? Okay. No, nope, that's it. We will move on. I'll continue to forward any information to you in case you don't get it in a direct email. Great, thank you. Next item on the agenda is a discussion item, public shade tree policy and the proposed select board updates. So quick, just to get you oriented, um, I had asked Sam Stivers to um, send us a copy of the most current version, and I distributed that to you folks. And um, I had mentioned to Mimi that there was part in um, a small phrase in 6E that was included that you had requested. Um, so that's been in the Dropbox for your review. And I think that it was continued to the October 24th select board meeting. Yes. So um, Sam Stivers, Al Hamilton, Lisa, and I worked on um, making some requested changes to the public shade tree policy. Um, Sam had felt that the requirement for native trees was in conflict with um, our code. So he um, had removed the reference and uh, we Instead of removing the reference, we had um, put in that the trees must be on the uh, 2019 Southboro tree list with a preference for natives. And the um, the Southboro tree list is all natives or native cultivars. So no tree of heaven on the list. So I guess um, I would ask the board if they're um, in favor of the the policy as is, so we can report to the uh, to the select board, Mr. Stein. Uh, I'm going to defer at this point. I'm not 100 percent committed one either way. Thanks, Ms. Houlihan. Um, Mimi, uh, I know we've gone back and forth, and there was a second iteration where you had requested. So with the last change is that where they've added that in. And so you're comfortable with this last round of edits. I would support this last round of edits. Mr. Maria. Yeah, I support you as well. Thanks. Ms. Braccio. Nothing further other than to say thank you, Mimi, for spearheading this. Thank you. So do you, should we just vote that we support it? Uh, so moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? 
Seeing none, all in favor, Luttrell, yes. Stein, yes. Julian, yes. Demurio, yes. Braccio, yes. Would you like a um, notice of vote sent to the select board? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next item on the agenda, uh, 21 Highland Street Future Use Committee. You keep it all in your head so nicely. Just quickly on October 10th, um, the letter was drafted from the planning board to the select board um, as discussed at the last planning board meeting to request a seat on um, the new any future 21 Highland Street committee that was being formed. And then I'll, I'll pass it off to you, Mimi, because you attended the meeting. Yeah, we, so the letter wasn't sent because it was drafted on the 10th, but I was at the meeting and All right. informed the board that they um, that the plan board had voted that we would like an appointee on that the 21 Highland Future Use Committee. And there was a... Um, Al Hamilton was put in charge of writing a draft charge and the draft makeup of the committee. And in the, that draft um, committee make makeup, there was an appointee from the planning board, which um, during the discussion of the board, they removed the planning board. And they also removed the appointee from Chopsy because they want, they, um, were concerned with nine people on the committee and they wanted it seven, so they couldn't, um, well, a couple things, the, the chair said he didn't know why planning board wanted to be on it. And he also said that we were, had a member on the previous 21 Highland committee, which there was not a planning board appointee. There was a shop C appointee who happened to be a planning board member. So that was, that was incorrect. We did not have a seat at the table before. I did um, say that when I informed the select board of our vote that we are the elected board in charge of future planning for the town, which is why we wanted to be on the, the committee, but that, um, that did nothing evidently. So we're not on the committee. Who is on the committee? Um, an appointee from Open Space Recreation, Historical, two committee members who live within a half mile of the site, and two at large. Okay. Is that so seven? There is an agenda posted for a meeting on Wednesday at the Southboro Public Safety Complex for um, a roundtable discussion. And this was actually um, sort of initiated by Shopsy. Was, were you aware of this? Yeah, we talked about it. Yeah, I think Karina told me. Okay. When is that? So it's this is um, happening Wednesday at 7 p.m. Um, and there is a, a Here's Zoom. the agenda. There's a virtual... Oh. Um, just not posted here, but that's the agenda. Has not has that not been posted? Uh, well, I didn't print. I didn't look if it was posted yet, but I received oh. it so ahead of time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lett. So I would encourage anyone who's interested in uh, Shopsy's position, and you know, in can collaboration with those other uh, committees to attend. I think the select board has determined that um, affordable housing can't go in that building. So they, um, I think that's why Shopsy was also jettisoned from the committee. Ms. Houlihan. No comment. Ms. DeMaria. No comment. Ms. Braccio. Um, One comment, just it's um, a little disappointing 
and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Anyone in the audience? We've Anyone known. on Zoom? Oh, sorry. We have six attendees in the Zoom. No hands raised. The next item on the agenda is a discussion item. Master Plan Implementation Committee goals. And this is, is this Ms. DeMaria or are you? Okay, so um, see if I can summarize this. Um, so there's a request by the Master Plan Implementation Committee to um, get the opinion of, a, of the planning board um, in, a, in a joint session with the select board and master plan implementation to try to take a, a look at the, uh, uh, the goals as we move forward into the funding uh, time of year. I don't know if I'm quite saying that right, but an exercise that uh, Sam Stivers had done seemed pretty successful. And I think what he's looking for now is for some more input um, from the planning board. And I'll just try to explain that a little bit. What, what he did is um, went through the, uh, you know, privately as a member of the select board, not, not representing the master plan implementation committee at all, but he took a look at the, um, at the goals and recommendations and um, put together kind of a little sheet um, that he thought would be, you know, goals that could, you know, the other other select board members might be interested in um, working on with him and use it as a sort of a tool to, you know, to work through the goal setting process that happened, I think, in July. And just for the record, I'll just tell you what the, the four of them were. So we came up with four, um, increase housing diversity and affordability, improve connectivity and accessibility, broaden and increase the tax base, and uh, continue investments in for strong schools. So, you know, his, some of his um, thoughts and um, recommendations, I'm sure were taken into account. If you look at the select board goals, they have themes of this running, running through it. So the, the next wave is really um, for the, the select board to start um, the, the uh, you know, the fi financial part, I guess, for, for the year, right? Um, funding and that sort of thing. What we realized on master plan implementation is that there are some committees that have really great goals, but they don't have any funding. And they might even be long-term goals. So then say, well, it doesn't matter because that's a long-term goal. But what, Mr. Stivers brought up was, I'm not sure if I'm quite saying this right, but that it, it could be that there's a funding opportunity now. They, I think they, they have a, a consultant that helps them with funding opportunities. And so in, a, I think the spirit of goodwill, he is saying, well, you know, it would be really nice to hear from the planning board to see if we had priorities in our goals before they go through the, um, the fund, sort of, you know, the funding, um, and financial aspect of funding some of these goals. Um, as a master plan, we take no uh, implementation committee, we take no position. So, um, you know, there's there's no, um, I guess, you know, I didn't poll anybody on the master plan implementation committee to see, you know, what do you think should be prioritized? Um, but I think as a planning board, um, the idea that the planning board might have an opinion may not line up with Mr. Stiver's goals and what he presented to select board, but it could be that the planning board has our own set of prioritizations. And so what uh, Mr. Stivers is thinking is that we would have a joint meeting between uh, planning uh, select board and master plan implementation. And that meeting has been difficult to schedule because um, evidently, Select Board is not able to meet on the planning board timeline, um, and Colleen was helping out with trying to get some some meeting going. Um, but I've I've not gotten back to her yet with um, with any particular dates. 
So it's kind of a long way of saying, I think that the idea that um, he's interested to hear from the planning board is very nice. And um, as a planning board member, I have some ideas that are different than Sam's. <laughs> but um, I wanted to know if it's something that the planning board is interested to do. And I hope I explained that kind of okay. So just so I understand, so you want to know what the planning board's priority in the master plan goals are? So I think, you know, Sam presented it to the select board and I, I'm, I don't recall, but I think the select board is also interested to know what the priorities are for the planning board. I don't believe it's just a Sam's idea, although he was sort of driving this process, um, but I think he wants to be more inclusive and understand if we have any particular priorities. And of course, the way he did it was to take a look at all of the goals and recommendations and looking for common themes and then what we call affinities. And he came up with the four that I just read. And now the planning board, if we choose to do that, may or may not have the same kind of goals. So it's it's really just an ask okay. at this point. Mr. Stein. I mean, these goals, the ones on the document, Master Plan and Implementation Committee Priority Overview from June 11th, seem in line for me. Other, I don't really have much comment other than that. Ms. Houlihan. So I will be honest, I haven't read, again, the master plan. Um, so I, if we do that, I think we should come to a conclusion amongst ourselves before engaging in the conversation with select board and the implementation committee. Um, but I would support like just a discussion amongst ourselves is what, you know, are we aligned on the goals that were listed? Do we want to redefine them or reprioritize to be able to support 20, what are we in 2025 budget process? I don't even know. Okay. Ms. Braschio. I completely agree with Marnie. Thank you. Yeah, I do too. I think we need to discuss as a board. And are you looking for these broad like affinities that these four things that are in that email? Well, um, I mean, that's the way that that he did it. I, I think there's definitely themes. Um, as a planning board, I, a member, I can tell you, you know, one of the themes I, I thought should have, you know, I would have put, for example, would be something more to do with um, sustainability and open space natural trees. resource sort of on the net trees natural resource something along that i mean so you, you can i could just say that you know he was able to articulate what he thought you know and and it, it you know was probably very effective in the in the goal setting process so now that we're coming into the budget setting process um if we're being invited for our opinion that is one that i would like to see cuz i i you know, I'm not sure um, how that will play out, but um, yeah, we, yeah. So what I the do, I did include a document in the Dropbox that Judith has put together for us, which is just all the boards and committee goals um, as it was printed in the um, in the master plan. That's the, like the, I think the quickest way to take a look at everything without having to read the you know the master plan all over again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was just referring to you were referring to that. Yeah, well, that looks good to me. How did it get boiled down to four things from that? So, so, so that was Sam Stivers that um, that did that in 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 his participation in the goal setting process. Those were the things that he wanted to see, and he linked them to the goals that were in the master plan. So even though it says master plan implementation, the, the 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 implementation committee didn't have any input into that. But I think he was saying it's it was sort of being driven from the work that um, implementation committee was was doing. Um, and yeah, I mean I think that they're fine goals. I think that um, you know being asked for our opinion is an opportunity to bring something else to the table as they're thinking through the budgets. 
Thank you. I, I'm sorry. I'm not, I, I'm missing something. The June 11th document is a, like a good summary of the master plan, right? That, that, and then that, somehow that, Sam trims it down to four things. So when he was, um, yeah, so when he was going into goal setting, um, I guess he probably thought, okay, you know, of everything in the master plan, these are the, you know, because the way that exercise worked from what I understand, you know, they had the opportunity to put forward their thinking on what their priorities should be. And so those were his uh, priorities. Can he do that? Well, um, you know, I kind of regret that it says master plan implementation on there because the implementation committee didn't have anything to do with it. But um, yeah, I mean, those were his thoughts going in and he had to negotiate with others. Wait, um, Debbie, what, which document are you talking about? You and Jesse are talking about the word document that says master plan primary goals for prioritization. Titled MPIC Priority. Right, you? right. Oh, that June was, 11th. Yes, yeah. June yeah. 11th. And then there's an overall master plan implementation goal list that's in the master plan. Yeah. That compiles all the goals. Yeah. That's the one we plan. should look at if we're going to do this sort of an exercise. Mm -hmm. That date, the document dated June 11th is the one Sam created Sam. as he brought that in for the goal discussion of okay. the select board. What's the left board discussion? I'd show those on the screen, but it's probably a lot of information. So if anybody's interested, yeah, and the, have I, them, the other we'll thing, post I, them with the minutes. And I don't think, I'm not sure I gave it to you, but the other thing is that the, the select board has 2024 goals. Um, and I don't know, did I? Did that's I, in the Dropbox. Oh, I put that in the Dropbox, Dropbox as well. So, um, you know, that's another document to look at. So presumably those are the priorities and, you know, we're getting asked for our opinion as well. And they may be in tonight's meeting packet that's posted with the agenda. It's just, it was a large document, so yes. I can't recall, but they're most likely in that document for the public if they want to see it there. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, 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 um, I think the request was very nice. And I think also that what he did was very effective because in, in looking at the um, select board goals, some of his wishes from this June 11th document, you know, are ended up to be goals. I mean, he had to negotiate with his other members, um, you know, and we're not uh, goal setting, but what we're asked is our thinking about priorities. And that has to do with the lineup of the budget. So is it possible to maybe sequence that to have just a, a discussion amongst ourselves to kind of come look, spend time on the master plan, the bigger document, not the June 11th, which I think is now biased um, to, to that one perspective that Sam brings and then bring up our conversation and then sequentially, maybe after our next planning board, try to find a, a time that works between, you know, whatever three and three of us. Like November 27th. That's the next meeting after November 6th. I don't think their schedule lined up with ours. I think we had to find a separate time is what Deb was suggesting. Yeah, I think there's con. I was there's told conflicts. there's conflicts for the next several. I, I didn't check exact dates, but I think that there's conflicts with some of the members on our on our meeting dates. We'll have to pick a different day. Mm. Anything else from the board? And just confirming that the the um the goals list that we were talking about uh, is in the meeting packet for tonight, so the public can go right to the uh, planning board agenda location, and it's there. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Freddie Gillespie again, and I'm on the Open Space Preservation Commission. Not speaking for the commission because we didn't know about this, but I wanted to give you a perspective that if you're moving forward on this maybe somebody should talk to all the boards and committees and commissions that have been charged because um, we had a representative on the master plan committee. Did you meet for like three years? And our open space commission regularly reviewed what was going in from our representative to your, to the master plan committee, as well as participated in public um, meetings on it. And we thought that the master plan came out with the goals and the priorities. And now I'm very confused because another thing that happened is 
some of the things that we brought forth during the process, um, we weren't planning on being in charge of it. We were just saying this needs to get done. And then when the implementation happened, it was like, well, you either need to take it on or we will take it out of the plant. And then we were very concerned about that because we're not a department, we don't have staff, and we were assured that we didn't have to actually necessarily do it, but facilitate getting it done and that funding and, and, and resources would be made available to our commission so we could move forward. And I will say since um, the master plan came public and we have our charge and our marching orders is how it you know seems how we've treated it, we go through it, we've gone through it, we're working on, you know, implementing, like one of the things was the invasive species. So we're working before the law, spotted lantern fly got here. We actually thought the emerald ash borer was the big deal, but we're working with DAR, Department of Agriculture Resources to do a, a workshop, right? So we're being proactive. Lantern fly showed up a little bit sooner than we thought, but still we're working on these issues that we don't really, that we were looking for support from the town. And now I'm hearing that maybe this isn't a priority, but it was a priority that we were charged with from the master plan. So I'm confused, do we have a master plan or are we starting a new set of goals and priorities? And I'm just asking that maybe you talk with the, the committees and commissions that are actually working on it and thought they were going to get some support to help move this master plan forward. Thank you. Mimi, do you, do you wanna address that? I, I no. Thought, no, well, I can tell you um, that I'm not on the implementation. Well, yeah, the implementation committee takes like no no position because it, we feel like it's not our role. Um, but I think that there is an acknowledgement that there, are, you know, as each of us are assigned to um, boards, committees, departments, that some some of the more difficult cross functional kinds of goals are are really the ones that are going to get left behind if they don't get some attention. And I think possibly that's what Mr. Stivers was was trying to do. Um, and in terms of priority, I don't think I can speak to that. Um, you know, you could have a goal that's high priority, but you need some funding. And I think that this is an opportunity to say, okay, maybe this was long term. This was the ten year goal, but we might have a funding opportunity right now that might change the priority a little bit. Um, I don't know because I didn't have anything to do with setting the priority, um, but I just think that this is a nice opportunity to bring a different perspective um, that you know we might want to do. So the implementation committee, are there members that are assigned to work with the different boards and committees that uh, contributed goals to the plan? Yes. Yeah. So there's presumably somebody working with the Open Space Preservation Commission or following their goals? Yes, or reaching out quarterly is, is how it's um, set up. Yeah. So... <laughs> So that's how um, this is, the implementation committee is supposed to work is that they reach out to all the, well, individual members have uh, certain committees that they reach out to. So I think that the select board is asking for the planning boards of our goals, our priority goals. And I know that sounds, you, you know, you have to move forward somehow and you have to, you can't fund everything, but shouldn't that have, I'm just throwing this out there, shouldn't that have been looked at when we set short-term, long-term, mid-term goals, that if we, if the master plan, I had confidence thought that these things could be achieved within those time frames, And when you start setting priorities amongst the already existing priorities, some of those are gonna drop off. And I'd just like to know if I can stop doing some of the work because we're working really hard. And I wasn't hearing any natural resources or open space on that list. And if we're not gonna get funds to do it, we can't do it, so why are we, you know, 
banging our head against the wall. Yeah. So just to confirm that 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 is the um, that's that was Mr. Stiver's list, but um, it made its way. You know, some of those sentiments, goals, and recommendations made its way into the um, select board goals. Um, but I I take this as an opportunity. When I looked at that list, and I said, "Gee, there's no open space. There's no natural resource. There's no sustainability." And I know that you know it all ranked very high in the um, surveys. So I take it as the opportunity that, you know, we can at least maybe have a discussion on some of these topics that um, are not maybe listed as select board goals, because we didn't have anything to do with the goal setting process, right? That's a select board thing. But there could be some goals that are very important that need to be funded that are not select board goals. And I think that's this would be our opportunity to bring those up. And the answer is no, you can't stop working really hard. <laughs> um, and I wouldn't, as you know. <laughs> we've, we've done an awful lot when we had a $150 budget. So I just don't want to see that, you know, in planning. And I guess the confusion is, is the master plan is the planning board's document. And the selectmen are talking, it sounds like creating their own separate priority list of some of the things within the master plan. And hopefully what my ask is that the planning board, when you talk to yourselves, maybe talk to the committees that are charged with doing the work because, you know, if no one talks to us, you don't know what we're, I know there's an implementation, but you know, how many months has this been out there? The implementation committee? Eight yeah, nine. so yeah. you know, it's not it's not as I mean, we talk about this every single meeting. And you know, we're not writing up reports because, you know, then we wouldn't be able to do the work we're doing for the implementation when she asks or comes to us, we would tell her, but I'm assuming that other committees may be doing the same sort of thing and maybe they would like to be considered for funding for some of the projects they're working on. If but if no one asks us, but it sounds like there's a I don't, I'm hesitant to even call it parallel track because you have a master plan and then you have this other thing that might have some of the goals of the master plan on it, but I didn't hear any of the things we're working on it. So that was what I just wanted to make you aware of. Yeah, and I'll just say uh, one last thing is that as we um, continue to work with different committees, we are starting to understand that, um, uh, like for example, I work with Leah on the EDC and I heard for the first time also that she has, you know, she's talking to the EDC about um, housing choice and that they wanted to develop a position. And uh, one of the things she said is, well, you know, we'll probably have to, you know, do something with a, a new, another grant to find more information of one, maybe that was the one stop grant. I'm not exactly sure what she said. So that's an, op that's a, that's an example where, um, something presents itself, MBTA communities, they took that in and they said, okay, in order for us to have a position or maybe tick a few things off of the uh, the goal list, you know, we're, we're probably gonna need to ask for a grant. And so that would be an example, I think, where the select board may know, may want to know, you know, do, do you need money to do that sort of thing? On the master plan implementation, that's a question we haven't really been asking yet because as we rolled it out, we only recently started hearing back from the committees. I can't do this if I don't have any money. Yes, we heard it from your committee, <laughs> to be honest. Before but you rolled it out. Before you rolled that, yeah. Yeah. So, and I know not the town's not made of money, but if you're setting priorities, I kind of thought that the master plan already kind of did that. And I don't know. There's 200 goals and recommendations. I'm not sure. It did that. Can, can you confirm that, Mimi? I don't think they're prioritized. Well, in, in time frame. Okay, short term, long term, and yeah, yeah, and mid, mid term. Okay, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is this mic on? Can you hear her? Son? Is the mic on? Thank you. I see the thumbs up. Okay. Um, um, Marguerite Landry speaking as a private resident. Um, I think that the exercise of finding goals 
was something where a lot of what the boards and committees seem to be doing is is having to act reactively because something comes along. But I think the master plan is sort of a wish list and it does have a lot of items in it. And I think this would be an opportunity to say, what do you, um, as any board, as the planning board, what would you, just a few things, that if you would pick out of that list to work on now, what do you think is important? Because it's hugely unwieldy, but just, I mean, not reacting to things being thrown at you, but just actively, what do you see as important for Southborough to do right now? And I think that would be a really good um, conversation between a lot of the boards. We can't do it all, obviously. Some of it will be moot. But what are three things you'd really like to see happen this year, for instance? That's my that's my sense of it. So um, my concern is when you have so a board of so, a select board member. I'm speaking as a private citizen. What, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about Mr. Stivers. Yes. List his priorities. Mm -hmm. To me, as a private citizen, as a elected official, it leaves me wondering, well, gee, what happened to the rest of the master plan? If this is the way our select board views this as something that he can to pick and what, choose what the priorities are, when you do that it, sort of makes the whole point of having an implementation committee and all these other boards and committees moot. Well, it's kind of bad, but it's like when you do a, a personnel evaluation for somebody, you don't tell them 35 things they need to fix next year to tell them the four most important things they need or the four things that you think they can i don't think i agree with that it's a lot of it's, it's, a, it's a lot of items i think this was sort of try to get a I, I think th i think the disconnect is the the select board sometimes in my opinion mm -hmm. just me talking uh, just seems to okay. think just seems to disregard everybody else's input and go off on their own agenda see to me and this is a pattern we've seen that i understand consistently i know but and it frustrates us or me i think me. the request here or the or the sort of indirect request here was well the planning board what do you think is important to work on let's talk about it because we can't do all thousand items in the master plan that was just my sense of it i mean the rest of the select board may have, have different ideas about it but i think it's an attempt to say we can't do all of it let's i mean what do you personally think is important to do and i think that not everybody has the same four things that sam had either we, we... most assuredly i just want to add i i was grateful that sam looked to the master plan because creating a goal like abolishing the public works planning board it was nowhere in the master plan and that seemed very personal um and i you know, and had it, there not been a select board meeting to discuss it, it wouldn't have been replaced with anything. So I, I think when we look at, you know, we have to just acknowledge that the, the select board does set goals every year. And if I was grateful that Sam looked to the master plan and that was his list. Um, and, uh, you know, now he's asking for, for our opinion. So I Sam has not... Sam has his uh, hand raised. Oh, good, Sam. Set the record straight, Sam. Everything that I, <laughs> I, I messed up. I promoted on. him to panelists, so he has a chance to speak to us. Hi, Sam. Good evening. You can, you can defend yourself. Thank you. Uh, uh, this actually started out as a very simple concept, as a matter of fact. And uh, to Jesse's point, uh, this list that I had uh, proposed as a starting point was not my personal list. What I did was I looked at the select board goals that were uh, generated by our planning session, I guess, last July. And the comment that I'd made to the master plan implementation committee was it would be interesting to first figure out um, um, where the select board is in terms of goals, because the select board has a fair amount of influence in determining the budgets. So if we could align what the select board felt was important to what the master plan implementation process felt was important, that would be a good way to uh, work together and select things that might be able to be accomplished. Since there were, I think, 50 some odd goals out of the master plan, and as somebody mentioned, a couple hundred implementation steps, there's no way we're going to get all that done, certainly, but let's pick ones that uh, 
people seem to be aligned on. And to Debbie and Marguerite's point, um, if there are places where the planning board feels things are important that were not part of the select board goal um, activity, then there's an opportunity to uh, make those comments, suggestions, and have a discussion about uh, getting some of those higher on the budget priorities, for example. So the goal, again, was to try to work, get people to work together on this in a way that will uh, wind up with things that we can all together be behind in terms of trying to get some near-term progress on. So that was a simple concept. And the select board, I've mentioned that at select board meetings, I think there's support for having this meeting between uh, planning board, select board, master plan and implementation committee to see where we can find uh, common areas to push on together in this process. So that was the simple concept. And to Jesse's point, uh, again, this was not my personal list trying to commandeer the process somehow, but to try to align things that we're all working together. So, so Mr. Stivers, how many, what is the number of affinity topics that will be allowed? Uh, as far as no specific... you're, you're, it seems like you're you are distilling the master plan down to what is feasible from a budget standpoint in effect um, that, that is what what is there room for on the uh, list i i don't know the answer to that jesse um the the budget is obviously uh um, you know scarce resource and so i picked those areas that seem to me to be uh common themes out of the select board goal setting process that also seem to have good overlap with the master plan committee. But I'm certainly not individually prepared to say that the number is one or three or seven or whatever, but any guidance that the planning board can provide or any input that the plan, planning board can, can, can provide in terms of what areas are important. And we've had one this evening, for example, that uh, sounds like planning board is headed toward putting on the table, which I certainly encourage. So again, there's no specific number, there's no specific budget number at this point that we've allocated some X dollars out of the budget to support master plan goals. But I think that uh, to me, that's a conversation that we have and try to figure out, is there a way to define some things that uh, both groups seem to be believe are important and achievable? So if I can just challenge this for a second, just for the sake of conversation, sure. if there is no set number, why distill it down at all? There must be some set number in order, because you, you've, You've you've put pulled four things out and sort of pushed the rest aside. So how did you I, I'm just trying to understand the thought process, the you know, how has this been quantified? Like what why four instead of five or six or eight? It it, it was a very subjective process on my part. I looked at the select board goals and I looked over the master plan goals. And I said, here are four areas that seem to have common support. And yeah, I could have driven it deeper and looked for other things or made a shorter list even, but that seemed to me to be a fairly workable list for discussion going forward here. So no magic behind that, just very subjective. And if you have a different view of that, Jesse, I'm certainly willing to entertain it okay. or anybody else for that matter. The different view is, well, I don't, I, I just don't, I don't know. I don't understand why doing why we're doing this this way at all is is you so you're basically saying we can't do everything so here are some here are the priorities and you want to know what our priorities. here are some things that seem to have support and uh, does the planning board agree or does the planning board want to change that list uh, I think I'm certainly open to listening to other views of this so no requirement if the planning board doesn't want to engage in this that's the planning board's choice but uh, I'd like to be able to work together on it, I guess. Jesse, I think the question is, um, you've got a lot of expertise as a board, a huge amount. What do you think is the most important group of things to focus on in the next two years? I mean, you don't have to answer it, but it just it would it would interest me to know proactively um, what what you would like to see happen. No, and that's great. I, I personally, and the other board members will, will weigh in, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I hope that we're not just spinning our wheels and wasting time. I hope that our input is actually considered and, you know, makes the list. I maybe, hope we make the cut. Maybe one goal would, 
would be to see less frustration between two major boards. <laughs> well, we appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ms. Houlihan. Um, yeah, I did something just dawned on me and then it just slipped my mind again. Um, oh, so, so something we do in corporate America is called a long range planning process. It's a five to seven year plan, which I think is what this master plan is, right? It's 10 years. Ten. We're now, it was 21, right? We're going into 24. So now we're at that seven year, but wouldn't that long range planning strategy couldn't we think about it or contemplate it that way? I mean, the way that I would look at this is like almost putting the goals that have been deemed short-term, mid-term, long-term, and really looking at every group's goals, um, open space, conservation planning, everybody had kind of components to that and building that out and prioritizing. I mean, obviously short-term, if we're look at, looking at a three-year window, what are the short-term priorities for our, our strategically? Like, I see what you're saying, Marguerite, is what is our strategy? You know, we, we want to get to kind of those open goals, but that's a strategic planning process. That is much more collaborative. That is kind of what Master Plan did in trying to compile this. So for me, what I see Master Plan is that long-range strategy. Now we actually have to do the financials to support that. So I feel like that, much to Jesse's point, that's already been laid out in a plan. Maybe it's the way that we look at the plan and that maybe in a, a document that's linear is, is difficult visually versus you know putting it out in a, a different perspective. So we look at those clear buckets by department and we have that conversation and work at that from a strategic level. Cause I just think we're kind of tactically like just like throwing a lot of noodles at a, at a wall right now that might not help. And so, but I do think if we pull ourselves back from the bigger picture and to Jesse's point. So I think I'm, I guess my perspective would be to look at the master plan, kind of say, suggest what we did before is come back and discuss it. I think um, Ms. Gillespie, with your recommendations of going to the different, you know, let's let's have each of uh, you know chime in with open space and conservation because everyone had to deem their short term, mid term, long term. You must have a budget in mind. What do, what is it going to take to eradicate some in, invasive species? What does that look like? Have we as an I don't even I don't even engage in our budget planning process as as a a, a town. It seems very limited and very. Um, um, you know, two year focused. If we thought about that in a much bigger scale, we can't change that this year, but can we start maybe thinking about it that way and have the committees think about that short term, long term, and maybe think about it in that one, three, five year if seven years is too late. So that's kind of would be my suggestion back to the select board and Sam to your process. But I think it's 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 been laid out in the master plan. I think we just need to look at it a little bit differently. I applaud your approach to try and refine it so we can get to something, but I don't think you should granular, make it so granular that it's a one year event because some of these things will need funding over three to five years. Mm -hmm. Mr. Litt. Tim Litt with the board. Um, as I listen to this, you know, I, I, I've spent a certain amount of my life in corporate America and long range plans and trying to figure out, you know, what, what on earth we're going to do um, as well. I mean, it seems like there's a, a, an intermediate step that's missing here. And that, you know, you know the master plan went out and said, um, here are things that, that, that we think should be done. And there was a sponsor for each one of them and sort of a description of what a nice end state would be. If I were trying to, to you know, sell this to a, a board of directors or an investment committee or whatever, the next thing I would do is go down each one of them and say, um, what would it take to accomplish that goal in terms of time, people, and money? Then you can have the conversation of saying, okay, this is the size of, of, of the problem. Now, what can we afford to do and work the next step? But as far as I can tell, the master plan stopped with the, you know, here are the desirable end states and why we think they're important. I thought it would be the job of the implementation committee to 
you know, go back to the people who would have to uh, implement each of those things and say, okay, what would it take to, to achieve this goal? Because that's what you have to go to advisory and uh, selectmen and, you know, the rest of the budget process with. It's not going to happen because you think it's important. Um, it won't happen if you don't think it's important. It's just, it does, it's not sufficient to say it's important. It's, you have to take the next step and say, because it's, you know, whether it's important or not, this is what it would take to get there. Now, given, you know, the importance, how do you match that up with available resources? Because, you know, even in the corporate world, we end up, you know, hitting, um, you know, financial limits or resource limits, and we have to then sort things out. But we can't do it unless we know what we think it's going to take. And then, you know, people like me argue with other people about, well, you know, I think there's technical risk here. I think there's, you know, legislative risk there. Um, you know, how much, you know, what, what does that resource pool really look like as opposed to what do you wish it looked like? And then you go to the next step. And I think somehow that intermediate step is being skipped in this and that is guaranteed to result in frustration. Yes, ma'am. So sort of in line with what Mr. Litt just said, I would have looked at the master plan and you know, my takeaway is that this is the master plan. We didn't call it the master, I have a dream or a wish list. A plan is a plan. And, and when they developed it, they thought it was doable and not everything on there cost money. So to say, oh, we're going to put money to this area without knowing what actually needs to be done. So with budgets, because I know we have run into budget issues, right? But we were told, you know, maybe there'd be someone to do some grant writing. I can't do grant writing and get the work done. You know, if we, you know, somebody to go out and look for the grants. I mean, this has been talked about over and over again, but it always seems that the open space issues never get looked at when someone's going out to look for grant money to see you know what's needed and we're not staffed so we can't be looking for grants writing grants doing the work and we'd get a lot of work done pro bono right so i find and it doesn't just happen there's time a lot of time developed i mean a lot of time invested in finding someone pro bono who's going to come out and do a workshop and then having to plan all that you know, other departments, when they're planning a workshop, they have someone who's making the calls, setting up the room, getting the materials. We're doing all that ourselves. So talk to the commissions and committees and say, you know, how how could you be helped? And is it a funding thing or is it some resources or is it a grant? Not everything costs money, but there is support that's available. And to just take a list and say, well, we're going to fund this and not that just seems short sighted to me. And it's leaving out some really major components no matter which ones you pick. If you pick open space, you're leaving something else out. I'm not saying it's just us, all the boards and committees. So um, I, I am disappointed to hear and to find out that people think that this master plan is not doable, that we're only we're not supposed to be looking at it all because like I said before, I'd like to know which things are being taken off my plate. So thank you. Nothing. So does the planning board want to have this discussion or should we discuss this with the implementation committee or how should we move forward? So I think that based on um, this discussion tonight, unfortunately, we probably would be best served to set some time to devote to examining the master plan and picking priorities and hoping that I, I'm very cynical about this, as you can tell, but uh, this is what we're working with and uh, we're gonna do the best we can. So I, I would support us uh, setting up time to 
engage in this process. Ms. Um, yeah, I guess my question would be, Deb, since you are on the implementation committee, I think it would be useful for us to actually, I, I, I think the Open Space Commission has a very good point. And so the, the question that I have is, it's kind of goes back to Mr. Litt's comment, like if each commission has gone through and said, okay, this is going to take time, talent, or treasure. That's really what, what needs to be surfaced up from each group to be able to look across everything, to be as a, a, a town, to be able to say, okay, we have resource. We can do that. We're not going to fund, but we're going to be provide this resource for these two departments. But we don't have that information. So it's, I think as being the, the owners of this document, it's really important for us to have that information to be able to help prioritize or at least put our contributions forward. Is there a way for the implementation to you, for you to email the implementation people to just email the people that are on their, you know, who they touch base with quarterly to see if they've compiled some sort of document that helps to say, in order to accomplish our short-term, mid, medium-term, and long-term goals, we expect that we'll need, you know, these things. So um, we we have um, on our committee, um, Kat McKee and Judith Watson created uh, kind of like an intake form, and I think the form was appended to the first report that we gave you in the springtime, so you could see it. It may have been modified once since then. And that was the modification. Um, and so just remember, we're in the fourth, we're starting, the, or we're in the middle of the fourth quarter, and we just started this year. So if you are reaching out to boards and committees, we're reaching out to every other quarter. I was wrong. It's not every quarter. Some of them are every other quarter. Um, then you're just really finding out, you know, it's the, right, the, the touch points really are just kind of coming together. Um, we've been, I'd say, a little hesitant to change the form to say, what do you need to reach this goal? Because it's always money. And so that's not really helpful. Um, but as we speak to um, our connections, um, that is uh, something that we're starting to gather in terms of information from the, on the implementation committee. And that's coming in the way of um, these intake forms that are going into the report that's given to the planning board. So when I came to the planning board first time, I don't know if it was April, um, there was a question about what else would you wanna see? Is this what you wanna see? And it was the first report. So I don't know, this is what we gave you, but that could be maybe something that you'd like to see. And I'd have to go back and take a look at the report because I don't know yeah. if, you know, how we're giving it to you, if there's room for that kind of level of information, but. We're just starting to collect that kind of information because it, it's going to naturally come up, right? Say a lot of the you know committees are saying, well, I really want to reach this goal, but I can't do it because of this reason. And so I think that's also information for us and for the select board because it could be that we can help them. But we're just starting to gather that information. And, and probably, you know, because there's a lot of boards and committees, um, some members are in different places with, with theirs. But I would say into this process, this is about the time where any individual committee or department realizes, uh-oh, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, Sorry. getting late. And, you know, how did it get to be 2023? And I don't think, you know, I'm going to make it. So we're starting to see that. Can I just jump in quickly? That... This implementation thing gives me heartburn right now. I'm a little nauseous because I'm going to tell you um, from the get-go, if you want me to write reports, I'm not doing the work. No, no, no. The implementation committee is compiling a report. On Based on what? Based Information we have to feed them that I don't have time to do that. Nobody's been talking to me since the first quarter. So to for me to take time away from what I'm doing, to tell you what I'm doing, Who's going to write it up? We need some supports. I, we need a secretary. We don't have, you know, it, it's challenging. And I understand the implementation committee. Many of those members, I assume almost all of them are on other committees. 
They're not going to be sitting down writing up reports, are they? Well, we are taking the information and, and inputting it into um, like a spreadsheet that's been made for us. And then that gets... So it's not a spreadsheet I have to fill out. No. I misunderstood. Sorry. Cause, yeah, yeah. No. Because even, you know, but can that it, is, that's the type of support staff we could use. So this this is kind of the point of the this, this strategic thing. Like you're so busy doing the tactical for you to pull back and, and give the big picture that I, I think it's helpful for you to pull back to give the big picture to help understand. So I can hear you say, I need a resource that I'm never going to be able to do that. I'm on the planning board, but, but for you to help us convey that, that that's a need. I, I don't know how else we're supposed to get that. Are we supposed to get that by attending all your meetings? Get what? Information to help you, what, what helps you implement your plan. No one's asked us what we needed to implement. We're just doing. So this is the first I've ever heard of, you know, it, we have a list of what we do and we're just doing our best to get it done. And now I'm hearing there's a discussion on who you're, who's going to get resources to do their work, but no one's asked us what we need. And we didn't, I know it's a chicken or egg thing, right? Yeah, I mean, but, it's good information for, and I'll, I'll bring it back to the master yeah, plan. I think it's more on like, the, I think we have purposely input. avoided asking the question because if you say, oh, do you need money to accomplish this? You know, right. that, I know, not a leading question, but um, but that is information that is probably coming in from. Well, uh, the it's office. not even, do we need money? It's like, how how are you going to, you know, how are you going to make this happen? We're just, so I'm, we're just making, we're just doing the best we can to get things done as fast as we can. Mm -hmm. And to hear that maybe there'll be resources provided to groups mm -hmm. and nobody's asking us what we need is kind of, you know, chilling. And then to think that we need to write a report to get something like if we need, if there's a, if there's a grant available, like that would be nice. Is there a grant writer out there? Is there anyone looking for grants to help implement the master plan? I don't think so. So it's not just the budget is what I'm saying. There's other ways of getting things done. I think that is also something that Mr. Stivers has brought up that it could be highlighted because I think he mentioned uh, at our master plan implementation that they do consult with somebody that suggests to the town what kinds of grants are available for what the needs are. And so if, you know, the more conversation I think that we have between the two boards, we can highlight some of, of that information. Maybe there's an opportunity, but we would only know by giving that to the select board. Right. Yeah. And some of my anxiety right now is um, where I was standing this afternoon and trying to get these things done as fast as I can. And that's just one area that we've got a lot of uh, work to do. Um, and that's not spending money, just lots and lots of time. What's that time, treasure, and talent? My commission has a lot of that. So thank you. Thank you. Not money, but... No treasure. <laughs> time and talent. <laughs> okay, so where are we? Do we want to bring that up at a future meeting then? Is it a discussion? Is it a discussion? Next meeting? Okay. Yeah. Mimi, if I may. Oh, yes, Lisa. Um, I, I think this is a much bigger discussion <clears throat> than just planning board and select board at this point. I think that's pretty clear from tonight. I think, as Freddie said, that there, there's a lot of groups, I'm sure, that are working towards the goals without any funding being in place. It might be helpful to know where they're at as we go to set goals and, and what it is that they specifically need. I don't know us setting priorities versus not knowing um, you know, what, what other what's going on with other groups is actually beneficial at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So, so the master plan implementation committee has started gathering some information. Yes. Can that be shared with the uh, planning board? Well, we do owe you a report. I think um, we decided to do it twice a year yeah. and we'll be, you know, preparing a report for you. Are you, are you asking for 
which committees or boards are departments are looking for funding in particular or priorities or what actually are you looking for? Um, well, just the feedback that you've gotten so far and what uh, boards and committees are working on and what their priorities are. Yes, yeah, so we we have these we have forms that we use to talk to each of the committees, and um, what happens is the information from the forms is extracted and put into an Excel spreadsheet. But I think I think each of those forms are available. I think okay. we're keeping them all. Okay, yeah. that may be. So helpful. let me think about the best way. To that may be helpful to inform our next. Yeah, and I'll talk to the master plan implementation too because, um, I, as I mentioned, I think that this is the question that was just recently added, and not as a leading question, but what will it take for you to achieve this goal? And th this is, you know, so we don't have a a lot um, of experience with that coming back yet, um, but we can certainly focus on that for the next round. Thank you. Thank you very much for your work on this. Thank you. This brings us to planner's report. All right, no hands raised currently in the meeting room. Oh, and thank you, Sam. I forgot to say, I just pulled them off the list. <laughs> okay. All right, planner's report very quickly. Um, what we have an update on is we received um, a 120 turnpike 40B, the mass housing eligibility, project eligibility letter today. And I, read it through very quickly and it's my understanding that they're approving um, their funding or whatever they approve i think it's the funding yes, yes. um secondly is um, um mimi and i've been working on a letter to the select board regarding the scenic road trees and stonewall mitigation um concerns that were expressed at the last meeting so we're just finalizing that and we'll submit it probably tomorrow morning if you're all set with that once we make it a little bit stronger <laughs> um the next thing is uh Mimi already already discussed the um informational meeting we had with town council and the zba chair on general you know generally speaking 40b information um and the process and all that and i believe the um, ZBA is very um, appreciative of the planning boards working with them and trying to help everything stay on track. And that brings us to um, meeting minutes. And we have four sets. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion. The planning board approve the minutes as written from the September 18th, 2023 meeting. Second. I have a motion and a second. I have discussion. Um, on line 44, Hokinson is H-O-K-I-N-S-O-N. Yes. And on line 119, um, applicants stated the two maples run the street tree list, I think, not that they were native. Tell me the one line again. 119. 119. On the maple on the maple trees. It says the maple trees are native or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it says the applicant agreed that the two maple trees were native. I think they were I think the applicant stated they were on the street tree list. Tree list. Yeah. Any other discussion? Seeing none all in favor um as amended. Latrell, yes. Stein, yes. Julian, yes. Demurio, yes. Horacio, yes. All right. I'd like to make a motion. The planning board approve the minutes from the September 19th, 2023 meeting. Second. Um, I have discussion on line 35. FAYA is P H A E A. Oh. Good catch. Yeah. Yeah. -E 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 Got it. Thank you. Any more discussion? Well, as I was absent, I will be abstaining. Seeing none, all in favor, Latrell, yes. Julian, yes. Demuria, yes. Rashio, yes. 
I'd like to make a motion that the planning board approve the minutes from the September 21st, 2023 meeting. Second. Um, for discussion, <laughs> line 47, it's a minimum of 15 units per acre, not maximum. Wait, which? September 21st, September 21st. Yeah. Oh. Oh, what are we at? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I have no discussion on the 21st. Uh, I, as I was absent, I will be abstaining. Any discussion on the 21st? Seeing none, all in favor, Luttrell, yes. Julian, yes. Demiria, yes. Baraccio, yes. I'd like to make a motion. The planning board approve the meeting minutes from the September 27th, 2023 meeting. Second. Sorry, that one line. 47, Aye. minimum. Minimum 15 units in it, an acre, not maximum. Okay. Good catch. Any other discussion? As I was absent, I will be abstaining. As I was absent, I will abstain. Seeing none, all in favor, Luttrell, yes. Demiria, yes. Braccio, yes. Anything else? Thank you. Let me look. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Um, just before you, real quick, I, um, I have a couple of plans we need to sign, just four sheets. That's it, very quick. They're uh, 14 Main Street and 28 Turnpike. All right. Adjourn. Is that what you want? Second. Motion. Yeah. Moved. <laughs> Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor. Latrell, yes. Stein, yes. Julian, yes. Mario, yes. Braccio, yes. Feel better, Lisa. Thank you. Well, if I could speak clearly didn't help that I can really get some words.